Welcome everyone to our continued coverage of Axiom Mission 3, also known as AX3. Hello, I'm John Rackham, Spacesuit Ventilation Lead for Axiom Space, based in Houston, Texas. And I'm Kate Tice, Senior Quality Systems Engineering Manager here at SpaceX. This webcast is a joint broadcast between NASA, SpaceX, and Axiom Space. And we're going to be talking you through the events of Dragon approaching and docking with the space station and carry our coverage through to the welcome ceremony that awaits the crew once they are on board the space station. The AX-3 mission officially started on Thursday, January 18th, when the Axiom crew lifted off from Kennedy Space Center's historic pad 39A at 4.49 p.m. Eastern Time. Our four-person, all-European crew will experience up to 14 days on board the International Space Station. The crew inside Dragon Freedom is now in position just outside the keepout sphere around the International Space Station, approximately 420 kilometers above Earth. They are awaiting the approach initiation burn that will be the first of several steps that incrementally guide them to the International Space Station. And the Crew-7 Dragon spacecraft, known as Endurance, uh, will be there to greet Dragon Freedom when it arrives. Dragon Endurance docked with the space station back on August 27th, 2023 at 9.16 a.m. Eastern Time for its six-month stay. So very soon, uh, we're going to have two Dragons up at the station. With that, let's head over to NASA's Gary Jordan for a closer look at Dragon's flight to the International Space Station. Hey, Gary. Hey, Kate. Hey, John. So great to be with you uh, to welcome Dragon Freedom and the AX-3 crew aboard the International Space Station. I'm here at the NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, in the International Space Station Flight Control Room. Teams here in joint operations with the teams over with you in Hawthorne, uh, working together to bring Freedom and the crew to dock with the International Space Station. We are just minutes away from the approach initiation burn uh, to take us into the approach ellipsoid. The teams have pulled go for that and have tested out the uh, uh, big loop communications. But of course, the journey to get here is uh, has been uh, quite a journey since uh, launching on January 18th. It all started with the phase burn, the first of five major burns to bring Dragon Freedom closer to the International Space Station. Dragon raised its orbit using the Draco thrusters over the past day as it chases down the space station. After that, the boost burn took place. Boost burn put our crew in an orbit where Dragon's apogee, or the highest point, uh, was 10 SpaceX kilometers Dragon lower than the station. Ground. SpaceX here. For a Pilot Walter Villaday confirming that the crew is suited and in position for that approach initiation burn expected here in just about six minutes. This is one uh, burn of several that has brought the crew closer to the station. We reviewed the phase burn and, and of course the boost burn was the one after that that brought the a Dragon to the 10 kilometer point that is lower than the station or the at least the Dragon's apogee. Uh, from there there were just three major burns left before uh, integrated operations and Dragon's final approach. After boost burn was the close burn. The close burn uh, brought Dragon on roughly a co-elliptic orbit with the International Space Station. So that means it was maintaining uh, that 10 kilometers lower than the station the entire way around Earth. That's in contrast to only being 10 kilometers lower than the station during the just, just the apogee or the highest point achieved by the boost burn. Eight hours after that was the transfer burn executed the fourth major maneuver uh, where we raised Dragon's apogee or the highest point of its orbit to just be two and a half kilometers lower than the International Space Station. Finally, we rounded everything out with that final co-elliptic burn uh, to once again maintain that consistent orbit lower than the station at that two and a half kilometer point. Now that final co-elliptic burn executed and brought Dragon just a little slower than expected, uh, so we'll be uh, tracking a docking time a little later than uh, originally advertised. Right now we're aiming for 4.40 a.m. Central Time. And of course, we're tracking towards that approach initiation burn in just about five minutes. Now that's uh, the final stages of Dragon's rendezvous with the space station. It's also where, like I mentioned at the top, we start integrated operations between the Dragon control teams here in, Hoth uh, in Hawthorne as well as the space station flight controllers here in Mission Control Houston. The teams will transition to integrated operations um, 45, or have transitioned to integrated operations roughly 45 minutes prior to approach initiation. So during the approach, SpaceX flight controllers 
controllers will work in tandem with the NASA team here in Houston to activate and test out a number of systems on Dragon, including the bidirectional communications with the C2V2 system, which stands for Common Communications for Visiting Vehicles, and sets up a data stream from Dragon to the station, giving another path for Dragon's telemetry to come to the ground and give an additional command capability to astronauts aboard the station. They'll also maneuver Dragon to the proper attitude and initialize the navigation sensors used for the methodical approach to station. Now we're tracking down to approximately 3.10 a.m. Central Time, where the Draco thrusters will fire on Dragon for the approach initiation burn. And that brings Dragon from about 200, two and a half kilometers below the station and just seven kilometers behind it. Then it will swing Dragon up until it's about a quarter mile, which is about 400 meters directly below station. So this maneuver will also move Dragon inside one of two checkpoints around the station that requires a set of go no go poles with the different control teams. The first checkpoint is called the approach ellipsoid, as you might hear it called the AE. It's an imaginary shape measuring four kilometers by two kilometers by two kilometers, essentially a large three-dimensional oval. Before Dragon is given permission to move inside that approach ellipsoid, the capsule is configured to be on what's known as a 24-hour safe trajectory. This means that if Dragon lost all control to the thrusters, it would be at least 24 hours before its trajectory would move inside that approach ellipsoid. Now, once Dragon arrives at the 400-meter mark below the station, it'll be on what's called waypoint zero. This will be the first checkpoint during our approach. The vehicle can hold there at 400 meters, but if all systems check out, uh, we'll continue on to waypoint one. Now, NASA and SpaceX teams will do a go-no-go no, go pole to move Dragon inside what's called the keep-out sphere, another checkpoint at about the 200-meter radius mark. Flight controllers use this monitor, all, this to monitor all arriving and departing vehicles. It's another chance to confirm all the guidance, navigation, and control systems are working correctly on Dragon before moving closer to station. It carries a similar requirement on the orbital trajectory that if Dragon were to somehow lose control of the thrusters and the space station would be in a safe for four orbits or about six hours rather than 24 hours required for the approach ellipsoid. Now from waypoint uh, zero to waypoint one, it'll swing out and in front of the station, arriving at a distance at about 220 meters. At this point, it'll be on what's called the docking axis. It means it's directly in front of that docking point. And the crew uh, today in Dragon Freedom are headed to the forward most port of the station, the node two forward port. That's where Dragon docked for the crewed missions, uh, many of the crew missions so far, and uh, where one of the two international docking adapters are located, the other being the Zenith or space-facing side. Now, uh, once Dragon is only 20 meters away, it'll be at what's called Waypoint 2. The spacecraft focuses on aligning its docking system with the International Docking Adapter. Now, as we get closer to that uh, docking ring, the International Docking Adapter, we may hear the call out CHOP. This stands for Crew Hands-Off Point, a little less than 30 seconds before docking. At this point, any aborts would have to be done automatically by Dragon. Now, after we hear that call, we are just meters away from contacting the International docking adapter, and that's the moment we are waiting for. We're tracking 4.40 a.m. Central Time today when our crew arrives at the space station. Dragon will fly in and make contact with that IDA, and that's called a soft capture. The soft capture ring will then retract until the sensors indicate it's time for 12 hooks to drive into place and give us that hard capture and firmly secure Dragon uh, to its new home on the space station. From there, uh, NASA astronauts Laurel O'Hara and Jasmine Mogbelli will manually pressurize the vestibule, the area in between Dragon Hat and station hatch, and uh, meanwhile, umbilicals will provide power and data and audio communications between the station and Dragon. Uh, we'll see some leak checks and then the hatch opening, uh, which will just come a few, uh, less than two hours, is what we're tracking now uh, after docking. Uh, but right now, we're just seconds away from initiating that approach initiation burn, and we'll stand by for confirmation of that burn. And confirmed, Dragon is in approach initiation. Draco thrusters are now firing.
Teams are confirming that the trajectory has converged onto waypoint zero. This is an indicating of a good and approach initiation burn. We should hear confirmation reported up to the crew momentarily. Again, waypoint zero is a mark that's uh, roughly 400 meters directly below uh, the International Space Station. At this point, the Dragon is inside the approach ellipsoid, but just outside what's called the keep-out sphere. Dragon SpaceX, we had a nominal approach initiation maneuver. And a reminder that if our CTV2 link is lost for 10 minutes without ground action going forward, Dragon will perform a breakout. And you've got timers available in your event details to follow along. Besides Dragon, on the big loop we have. And copy Dragon, just reiterating on the big loop, that was a successful approach initiation burn and proceeding into approach zero shortly. There you have it reported up to the crew inside Dragon Freedom as well as the International Space Station. We have a good approach initiation burn. Now you heard that uh, communication on what's called the big loop. Uh, this was coordinated ahead of our coverage today. Once the Dragon is within the vicinity of the International Space Station, uh, the Dragon, uh, the SpaceX teams in Hawthorne, as well as the teams here in Houston, the NASA teams uh, coordinate a single communication loop uh, where the teams in both control centers in Houston and in Hawthorne, as well as the two flying spacecraft, including the SpaceX Dragon and the International Space Station, all communicate on a single loop. You heard that confirmation, everybody checking in on that uh, good approach initiation burn. Now again, uh, the approach initiation burn takes us uh, towards a trajectory to converge with what's called waypoint zero. This is a marker 400 meters directly below the International Space Station. Along the way, it'll cross what's called the approach ellipsoid. Uh, this is the, another imaginary marker that has its own, uh, that indicates flight rules and um, uh, requirements for both of the control teams as well as the astronauts flying both spacecraft. But with that execution, we are now uh, on a trajectory to cross uh, the approach an, uh, ellipsoid. Now, along the way to waypoint zero, uh, we'll be checking that trajectory and can perform what's called a mid-course maneuver. Uh, this will make sure uh, that the Dragon is converging and continues to converge on that waypoint zero, as we're seeing now with the current trajectory. Once it, again, once it reaches that waypoint zero marker, uh, we'll likely see Dragon uh, continue along the way. It can hold at the waypoint zero marker, but what we see uh, most commonly is to uh, move right past it, execute a short maneuver to swing out from right below the station at that 400 meter marker to right in front at that docking axis, that's waypoint one. Uh, that sets us up right in front of the docking axis where Dragon continues to move in closer and closer for that docking. Again, we're tracking 4.40 a.m. Central Time. Dragon SpaceX on Dragon to ground, giving you the go to begin suit leak, per, suit leak check procedure for decimal zero one one. SpaceX Dragon on Dragon to ground in work. Part of the procedures for uh, reaching this milestone of approach initiation, all four crew members inside Dragon Freedom donned uh, those uh, SpaceX launch and entry suits that provide an extra layer of protection of pressure uh, should there be any indication of, uh, of a leak inside the cabin, uh, just as a safeguard measure. 
but all four crew members are currently suited up and in their respective seats uh, and were so and we're in this position ahead of that approach initiation burn now the procedures uh, have the crew suited and in those seated positions with their umbilicals plugged in to provide cooling uh, as well as communication from the suits uh, and the uh, communication devices inside the helmets through the dragon to communicate on these loops however uh, we still have yet to do those leak checks uh, another verification. Now, the suits are worn for the most dynamic parts of uh, Dragon's flight to the International Space Station, including, of course, the launch, uh, and then what they are preparing for now, which is the docking. Uh, after that approach initiation burn, there's plenty of time uh, to prepare and perform those leak checks. We're expecting a waypoint zero arrival in approximately 40 minutes from now. Of course, we do have the ability to execute that mid-course maneuver. Uh, and if we do execute it, we can expect it uh, in about 20 minutes. Plenty of time for the crew to perform those leak checks. Of course, this is a joint operation, so we have the four crew members inside Dragon Freedom, the Axiom astronauts, heading to the International Space Station to conduct their short private astronaut mission just two weeks aboard the International Space Station. But we have long-duration expedition members aboard the station now, uh, and they are preparing for the arrival of the private astronauts to the International Space Station. Uh, currently, timeline for today, Saturday, to support the rendezvous operations, uh, we have NASA's Laurel O'Hara and Jeff Jasmine Mobelli. Uh, so they're using a uh, special tool to monitor Dragon's approach. Uh, they are two of the crew members you see in the front there, next to uh, Commander Andy Mogensen, who is uh, uh, from a European it's Space Agency astronaut to, astronaut to the right. To ready for, uh, Dragon, we copy, and you are go to initiate suit leak check. You're seeing a view of the uh, flight control teams in Hawthorne. These are the SpaceX team that are supporting the flight of Dragon Freedom and the Axiom crew inside. Crew operations resource engineer being the voice that you're hearing uh, to the Dragon crew, confirming that they can initiate that leak sequence. They'll get the data there on the ground to confirm a good leak check to proceed towards some of the next milestones. Mid-course uh, expected if we end up executing it in about 18 minutes. Uh, arrival at waypoint zero in 38 minutes. What you're seeing now is a live view from the International Space Station. We have a tally-ho of uh, Dragon Freedom and the Axiom crew inside. The Dragon is uh, approximately four kilometers, is what you're looking at now, four kilometers away from the International Space Station. Space, space Station is, op is orbiting in uh, an orbital daytime as well as Dragon. Uh, we're just east off the coast of Argentina on the South uh, Atlantic Ocean. A great view for NASA astronauts Laura O'Hara and Jasmine Mobelli, who are uh, conducting the monitoring operations. Again, they have uh, they have the necessary tools to see the uh, range and performance of the Dragon vehicle and, and monitor its approach and ensure its safe arrival aboard the International Space Station. They, along with the flight control teams here in Houston, as well as the teams over in Hawthorne, all working together with the crew inside Dragon Freedom, uh, awaiting for the arrival and monitoring these uh, delicate operations. Again, we're tracking 4.40 uh, a.m. as our arrival and uh, contact with the forward port of Harmony. That's on the very front of the International Space Station. That's where Dragon Freedom will remain docked for the 14-day stay aboard the International Space Station. Laurel and Jasmine will uh, work in tandem to open up the hatches and pressurize the uh, what's called vestibule. This is the space in between where Dragon arrives and the hatch of Dragon and the hatch of the International Space Station that 
uh, space, that vestibule area is currently a vacuum. So they'll bring it up to pressure to match the pressure of the International Space Station as well as Dragon. Uh, it's what we expect, uh, is what we see here on sea level, 14.7 psi. Uh, it'll be a slow and methodical pressurization. There is some fluctuations that occur during pressurization due to uh, thermal, just to make sure it's thermally stabilized and we're getting a good read on that pressure. Uh, so we'll do that slowly and methodically before opening up the hatch. What you're seeing is a zoomed-in view from the station's external cameras. We're following along. You're seeing some and of the features Dragon of Dragon. And SpaceX, we see four good leak checks. SpaceX uh, Dragon, now we do confirm what we see the same. All right, with that, we have beautiful views of Dragon and confirmation that we have four good suit leak checks. This is just verifies that the crew continues to be ready for some of the next major milestones. Uh, we are well on our way to arriving uh, at the International Space Station later today. And of course, we're working together. We're here in uh, NASA's International Space Station Flight Control Room in uh, Houston, Texas. Uh, but we are working in tandem with the uh, crew uh, with the flight control teams that you have over in Hawthorne. Uh, let's go back over to Hawthorne with Kate and John to check in uh, on the crew and uh, what's happening over there. Kate and John. Excellent words, Gary. Thank you very much. Yeah, as you can see there on your screen, that is a beautiful shot of Dragon with our four Axiom crew members inside. And with that, while we wait for Dragon and the AX3 crew's arrival at the space station, let's go ahead and meet that crew that's on board. The commander of our flight today, Michael Lopez Alegria, or MLA, is no stranger to Axiom missions, Dragon, or the space station. AX-3 marks his sixth mission to space, having completed three space shuttle flights and a Soyuz mission as a NASA astronaut prior to commanding AX-1 with Axiom Space. Today, when not in low Earth orbit, MLA serves as Axiom Space's chief astronaut. Our pilot on today's flight, Colonel Walter Villade from the Italian Air Force, is taking his inaugural trip to low Earth orbit. Villade currently serves in the Italian Air Force and as head of the Italian Air Force's representative office in the United States. He has completed cosmonaut training as a space engineer, participated in multiple analog training missions, and flown a variety of aircraft and missions as an active flight engineer in the Italian Air Force. Our third crew member for today's mission is Mission Specialist Alper Izarache. Alper is the first Turkish astronaut to go to space. With 15 years of experience across a myriad of aircraft for the Turkish Air Force, Izarache got his start in the Air Force Academy in Istanbul, Turkey, and earned a master's degree from the U.S. Air Force Institute of Technology. He then flew as a commercial airline captain for several years before returning to duty in the Turkish Air Force. And finally, we have Mission Specialist Marcus Want, a Lieutenant Colonel in the Swedish Air Force. In November of 2022, Marcus was selected by the European Space Agency as an astronaut reserve. However, with the AX-3 mission, he now becomes the first project astronaut in ESA's history, a new designation within their ranks. So, if you couldn't tell by uh, all of those wonderful descriptions, it, this is really an incredible crew. Um, they are so well prepared uh, for spaceflight, even though uh, only one of them has been to space exactly. before. They're they're all really well trained, uh, and all these years of all these years of experience really speak for themselves. It really does, and it really just shows the breadth and caliber of this crew and how prepared they are. This is the first all European crew. They're, they're representing five nations across them. And with that, they're helping to expand low Earth orbit. All right, now let's talk a little bit about how they got to this point today. So earlier, to, or, sorry, on January 18th, starting their mission, crew wrapped up their pre-flight quarantine phase as they flew, you can see there, uh, from their quarantine facility, got on board uh, their helicopter and flew to their launch pad. Uh, you can see them coming over the Cape right there and <laughs> enjoying the trip, I think, looking at their vehicle for the first time. So fun. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't imagine what's going through their minds right now. You can see a mix of just pure joy and real solemnness as they get to greet their families and wave goodbye to them uh, before suiting up in the LLF. And that's really where we hand over to SpaceX. 
I love the f- that they were able to fly around the launch pad yeah. uh, before getting turned over to the SpaceX crew, which is what we see here. Uh, we put them in the Teslas and we drive them over to the Falcon support building, which is where our suit up room is located. And here we see them walking out of that building after completing suit up. Um, this is a nice moment here where we get to see, really see them as their crew on launch day for the first time. Uh, they then get back in those Teslas and drive up the about half mile uh, distance from the Falcon support building up to the launch pad. Um, and these Teslas are actually outfitted with cooling systems within it. So the um, umbilical cord that they plug into while they're in Dragon, they also get to plug in here as well to help keep some cool air flowing through the suits during this short drive. Um, they then uh, day, um, just this this view that they get and it's, it's the first opportunity that they have to see the vehicle up close on the day that they're going to ride that vehicle into space. You're right. And you can see the crew there so happy. Commander Michael Lopez Alegria and pilot Walter Villaday and then our mission specialist Alper and Marcus just enjoying their walk down to their vehicle. Yeah, so once they uh, got, you know, got in, uh, excuse me, into uh, Dragon, we have this moment here. (laughs) Yeah, the successful launch at 4.49 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Such a beautiful liftoff. And again, this is from pad 39A, which is, um, you know, it, it's a it's a historic launch pad. This is the launch pad where humans first went to the moon. Uh, so I just, I, I love seeing human spaceflight continue from from this location. Especially on a picture perfect day like that. Yeah, yeah, it was it was really great. Uh, and then after afterward, we were very fortunate actually, about an hour and a half after they lifted off, we were able to have uh, first you know, relaxed communications with them. Here you see their first on-orbit event. Um, It was so cool just to see them, uh, you know, obviously they took their suits off. They're a little bit more comfortable here. uh, And they they got to relay some some, uh, experiences back to us. MLA, uh, who, for those of you that might be unaware, this is actually his second time flying in in our Dragon spacecraft. So um, he is the founding member of our frequent flyer (laughs) club. Um, But during this on-orbit event, he noted that, that um, it was just ex- just as exciting this time as it was the first time he flew on Dragon with the Axiom One mission. Um, and something that I really appreciated was that he still noted that you really got the sensation that you're going fast. Yeah. Uh, and that's something where you know if you ride a roller coaster so many times, you might I don't know. I always kind of wondered, do you? Does, does, does it still feel the same? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And because we have so many um, people that fly on Dragon that have gone to space before, but in a different vehicle, uh, I have been curious in terms of, well, what about somebody that flies in Dragon more than once? What is their experience yeah, like? Yeah, so. and he said it's it's never a dull moment. Yeah. Like, <laughs> to, still. So here we have some more views of the Dragon uh, spacecraft. This is Dragon Freedom approaching the International Space Station. Uh, this is, I love these views because right yeah. now it seems pretty far away. <laughs> and before you know it, you're going to look up and we're going to see Dragon and it's just going to be like, oh wait, it's yeah. knocking on the door yeah. to you know get to the space station. You see it coming back into the frame there. Yeah, so this camera is positioned on the International Space Station, uh, and it is manually um, re, I I don't want to say removed, but it it is the controllers at the International Space Station Mission Control in Houston are actually continually adjusting uh, the angle of this camera because, you know, uh, they're going 17,500 hmm. miles per hour here uh, and Dragon is is coming closer. And so they have to keep um, readjusting the camera to make sure that it, that it stays in view. So that's why uh, it floats out of, out of the frame and then comes back in. <laughs> and that tracking readjusts to capture it back in frame and allows us to keep good visuals on the, on the vehicle as it approaches. So right now, all four crew members are there inside that capsule. We're looking at the capsule from the top down. Uh, so we're actually looking straight into the forward hatch. This is the hatch that will be utilized to dock with the space station. Uh, and then there's a great view here. The pointy thing kind of at the top there, or what looks like the top to us, that is the nose cone. So that's why there's a bit of an asymmetrical shape from where we're looking is because the nose cone actually... Um, uh, when after they get on orbit, they we open the nose cone and, to expose the docking mechanism in the in the forward hatch. So that's why it's a little bit asymmetrical from this particular view. 
but all four crew members are um, currently strapped into their seats. We're going to be stepping into some leak checks of, um, uh, as they recently donned or put on their spacesuits. Uh, we're going to perform those leak checks. As Gary said, we have quite a bit of time here um, before we move into the mid-course maneuver and eventually hit waypoint zero. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. But the crew, yeah, they put their suits back on, they're in their seats, uh, and we will perform those leak checks just to make sure that all of the zippers are pulled up into where they need to be to make sure the, the visors are clicking shut and then the locked position, really just to make sure that the crew put their suits on the right way. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, that's important because we do put the suit on whenever we're entering uh, more dynamic phases of flight. Right, and, and that, that process you just mentioned, Kate, right, that's a huge part of their their training, their pre-flight training to get them to this point. They know Absolutely. what to expect um, during to run this procedure while they're on orbit, and so that's going to be something that they on those suits, they do some nominal checkouts and they yeah. run that procedure to make sure that they're doing good. Uh, they have trained for that, but uh, of course, trying to get dressed in oh, space different. <laughs> <laughs> uh, would, would be a little different yeah. than, than training here, but you're absolutely right. And the crew is trained to uh, assist their other crew members in making sure that all those things are in the right places before they hop in their back into their seats and put their, their seat belts uh, or really their um, safety harnesses. They're a bit more complex than a seatbelt, but uh, yeah. So we we we know that they they do go through that training, but it's always different yeah. uh, when in space. So um, th speaking of training, as Dragon, as you can see here, uh, actually it looks like it may have floated out of view again, but it'll come back um, as Dragon continues its approach. Let's talk a bit more about that preparation that the crew went through in order to be ready for this mission. Uh, altogether, the Axiom Three crew spent about 35 days training inside Dragon and crew members individually received additional training specific to their role, uh, learning SpaceX protocols, International Space Station systems, and preparing for the, all the science and outreach activities that they'll be conducting while in space. So you can see here um, the crew training here at our Hawthorne training centers um, to prepare for their mission. Our teams here at SpaceX spent the last several months teaching the crew about orbital mechanics, how to live in microgravity, and running simulations of full missions from inside our Dragon training vehicles like the one you see here. Uh, the training program includes nearly 100 different lessons covering all aspects of the flight. The team also spent time at the launch pad as well as in the suit-up room and working through emergency procedures that would be necessary in the unlikely of a pad abort scenario. Yeah, I mean, that's a lot of extensive training just for the vehicle yeah. alone in addition to some other systems. So, but crew also spent extensive, extensive amounts of time in historic Building 9 at the Johnson Space Center that you can see there, learning from certified instructors on all critical systems necessary to ensure a successful stay aboard the orbiting lab. The team even prepared for unlikely emergencies and learned how to provide first aid in a microgravity environment. Additionally, they learned how to prepare food and make selections for their meals, as well as learned how mission control operates to better ensure mission success during their flight. They also had a chance to familiarize themselves with the gear that will enable them to document their trip, their research, and help them connect with those back here on Earth during their outreach events. Additionally, ESA and JAXA also play a critical role in cruise training. Each module has its own nuances, so gaining insight into the specialties of their racks and systems is necessary, especially for this particular mission. Extensive training on station navigation, on-orbit familiarization, emergency response scenarios, and repetition of walking through processes and procedures all help ensure that crew maximizes every second that they have during their flight. And simulating science research, operations, and even discussing how to sleep in space are all necessary lessons on the path to mission readiness. And with that, the National Outdoor Leadership School, or NOLS, provides a unique Earth-based experience for many astronauts before they fly. This is really a bonding experience for crew, which I just love. It can't be overstated how much teamwork factors into every aspect of their mission. And this training in particular really aims to thoroughly establish that between the crew. Here they focus on survival skills, resilience, leadership, followership, and overall teamwork to ensure they really are more than just passengers on the same rocket. The camping and outdoor adventure provides a solid foundation for the team to build on throughout their training. Knowles was definitely a highlight of this crew's prep and training, and you can hear it in their voices and see it in their faces when they speak about each other that they really feel like a family after this, and that's a critical component to build that trust between crew members. Now, you can't fully, truly experience flying into space until you fly into space, <laughs> but some really unique tools have been developed on Earth to provide the closest experience possible. 
Altitude chambers can challenge the body with oxygen deprivation in a controlled and safe manner. And human-sized centrifuges, centrifuges same, send the crew members for a spin to simulate the G-forces that will be experienced by the body during launch and re-entry. It can be a bit nauseating at times, but it does help the crew know exactly what to expect and be as prepared as possible for what launch day holds. Now, at the end of it all, there's a mission patch celebration train of, of the, uh, celebrating their training, and this has been a tradition since the earliest days of spaceflight. Crew gets to hang their training patch on the modules in Building 9, and this crew had a chance to be present for that patch hanging in Building 9 of Johnson Space Center. Um, we all know that spaceflight is a very serious business, but it's moments of levity like this, celebration, that help everyone pause and reflect on the incredible accomplishments being achieved every day by all of these teams. No matter how many patches join a canvas like that one, each one is incredibly special because of the people who make it possible, the crew and those here on Earth supporting each mission. It's so cool to, to see everybody coming together to yeah. celebrate that. So you were talking about Houston. Uh, actually, let's go back over to Gary Johnson, who is at Houston's, uh, excuse me, <laughs> who is over at Johnson Space Center uh, at International Space Station Mission Control. How are things going over there, Gary? Hey, thanks, Kate. You, you tossed at just the right time. We are just in the middle of a mid-course burn right now. So we're standing by as a very short burn, so we're just going to stand by and just monitor the performance. It's just a course correction maneuver just to make sure that we are right on track to meet up with that waypoint zero. And we're hearing good call-outs. Trajectory has converged onto waypoint zero. Teams are analyzing just to confirm, but we um, are right on track for hitting that milestone. We have a clock on the board here counting down uh, a little less than 20 minutes, and we're expected to arrive at waypoint zero. Getting beautiful views of the Dragon capsule. Since uh, we last talked uh, from Houston, we're now uh, more than halfway um, from our original uh, from our original distance. We checked in last at four kilometers. We're now uh, just a little bit more than one kilometer away. You're seeing uh, the Dragon making its slow and methodical approach to the International Space Station. Space Station right now is uh, Dragon, flying to the big loop. Nominal mid-course maneuver complete, and the trajectory has converged on waypoint zero. Okay, thanks. From the SpaceX Mission Control teams over in Hawthorne, crew operations resource engineer, the voice that you're hearing from Hawthorne to the Dragon crew confirming uh, that good mid-course maneuver. Again, that's uh, just a way to uh, make sure that the trajectory is converged onto the expected waypoint zero. You can see all the burns that have happened uh, over the past couple of days to get us to this moment. Approach initiation starting uh, very shortly after the start of our coverage this morning. Uh, and that mid-course maneuver is about the halfway point uh, just to get us right to where that waypoint zero is. That 400 meters that you're seeing is directly below the International Space Station. You can see two zones uh, surrounding the International Space Station, one being the approach ellipsoid, the other being the keep-out sphere. Each with their own set of flight rules, but once we reach ray point zero, we'll swing out right in front of the International Space Station just outside of that keep-out sphere, not entering until we get the all-clear. Now, the waypoint one is the next milestone, and it takes us immediately in front of the International Space Station. It still remains outside of the keep-out sphere uh, until the teams assess uh, the vehicle and its performance and trajectory uh, and do a go-no-go -no -go poll to say, yes, uh, we are good to move inside the keep out sphere. Now in a short uh, loss of signal with the uh, video from the International Space Station, we can expect intermittent uh, gaps in our video, uh, but the flight control teams have done a good job of securing uh, pretty continuous coverage uh, through the duration of our coverage from... Station uh, Houston on the big loop for Laurel and approach monitoring. Okay, 
Scan 2. Dragon range is approximately 1,000 meters. Monitor long range approach per steps 1 to 4 and 1 decimal 102. Dragon approach and retreat monitoring. ISS crew is now primed for vehicle approach monitoring. Copy, ISS is prime and we're stepping into the procedure. voice you heard was from here in uh, Mission Control Houston. The flight control room you see on the right of your screen, William Vu, the Capcom here in Houston, and the voice of Mission Control relaying up to the International Space Station teams. Uh, it's NASA astronauts Laurel O'Hara and Jasmine Mogbelli that are uh, working to monitor the approach uh, and docking of Dragon today. William uh, being on the far side of your screen. On the very front, you see Flight Director Judd Freeling leading the teams. Uh, Expedition 70 are the seven crew members uh, awaiting the AX-3 crew's arrival to the International Space Station. Station in the front, Dragon they're seated. Right, and attitude is as expected. Dragon is facing us. Houston copies. A tally ho from the crew aboard the International Space Station. Laurel O'Hara confirming she has visuals of the Dragon Freedom uh, as it is now inside one kilometer from the International Space Station. Flight control teams tracking a good trajectory. That mid-course maneuver put us right where we need to be, uh, on track to converge with waypoint zero in almost exactly 15 minutes from now. Again, white point zero being 400 meters directly below the station. Uh, once meeting that point, uh, we can expect uh, very likely to proceed past that waypoint and swing out in front of the station uh, to converge with the docking axis. From there, we'll make a slow and methodical approach inwards uh, to dock with the very forward port of the International Space Station. International Space Station and Dragon Freedom are currently flying 264 statute miles over the South Indian Ocean, just east off the coast of Madagascar. We can expect to be in an orbital daytime for quite some time here. Um, of course, it being the middle of the night U.S. time, uh, sun is shining over in uh, Africa and Asia. We're expecting to see continuous uh, sun views uh, illuminating the Dragon Castle and the International Space Station. Uh, sun may set. We might get some dimmer views right around 4.09 uh, a.m. Uh, Central Time. But for now, we can see a lot of the features of the International Space Station. Again, those intermittent loss of comms, those are very much expected throughout our coverage today. It's tracking and data relay satellites. These are geosynchronous satellites that communicate with uh, these low-Earth orbit spacecraft. Very short loss of signal. We regained it now and should maintain it for uh, at least uh, through the most uh, remainder of our sunlight. Again, sun setting probably around 4.09 a.m. is the predicted uh, sunset. We'll start seeing the views of Dragon Freedom and the AX-3 crew inside getting a little bit dimmer. But for now, we can enjoy uh, the International Space Station and Dragon flying over the Indian Ocean. We're seeing features of the Dragon spacecraft from here. Uh, on the very forward end, you can see that nose cone pointing straight towards the International Space Station, guidance, navigation, and control equipment uh, facing right towards there. And uh, uh, there is a communications link called uh, C2V2, Common Communications for Visiting Vehicles, relaying communications in between the two flying spacecraft. And of course, uh, relaying them down to the flight control teams you see in uh, both of the flight control rooms. Getting even closer now, we're seeing the flashing uh, docking light uh, that's in the very center of there. You can start seeing the features of the uh, soft capture ring, the gray center uh, that's around the middle there. 
Uh, that'll be the soft capture ring. As we uh, start getting even closer to the International Space Station, that soft capture ring will extend uh, and prepare for uh, a nice, cushy uh, contact with the International Space Station. It's that soft capture ring that allows for a little bit of cushion and then retracts to bring the Dragon in closer with the International Docking Adapter for a hard mate. There are four, there are 12 latches. Now start flying over a ground station to provide views from the Dragon itself. We got just a glimpse of the crew inside and are now seeing what the International Space Station looks like from Dragon Freedom. We're just a little over 600 meters from the International Space Station. Eyes on both sides. We have the Dragon looking at the International Space Station and Space Station Dragon, looking at the SpaceX on the big loop. Ground has pulled go for approach to zero, and we will be enabling the maneuver shortly. Expect to reach waypoint zero at 0958. And a reminder that Dragon will continue approach through waypoint one towards waypoint two without stopping. Space Freedom, we help you Excellent news from the flight control teams. Uh, teams have pulled go to pass several of the upcoming waypoints. We are talking about waypoint zero being 400 meters right below the International Space Station. You can hear flight control teams pulled go to pass not only waypoint zero, which is 400 meters below, but waypoint one, which is 220 meters in front of the docking axis in front of the International Space Station. Uh, this means we're inside the approach ellipsoid now and we're go to proceed past those two waypoints. No stopping. So right when we reach that 400 meter mark we're going to swing right out in front of the international space station to that 220 meter mark and then slowly and methodically start pushing in uh, waypoint two is only 20 meters away from the international space station a, com a commanded hold can be issued if necessary however uh, there might at, uh, in a there is another scenario where the dragon will simply pause uh, for just a few seconds to switch modes to uh, approach from waypoint two uh, so it'll just pause for maybe about 30 seconds before proceeding in. Uh, but again, flight control teams will assess Dragon's approach and performance along the way and does have the ability to command a hold at 20 meters just to wait and make sure conditions and systems are good before proceeding in for that docking. So far so good though, we're tracking a uh, trajectory that takes us in for that expected docking time of 4.40 a.m. Central Time, a little less than an hour from now. Dragon continuing to fly over the Indian Ocean, still seeing those features. You can see the nose cone deployed. Uh, this is something, this is a feature of Dragon that's deployed uh, very quickly after spacecraft separation uh, from the Falcon 9 rocket. Um, you can sort of see it swung out. Uh, when it does so, it exposes the docking ring and the docking lights, which you see flashing. But uh, one of the primary reasons it needs to unfold are those four forward bulkhead Dracos. Uh, those Draco thrusters provide much of the force needed uh, in those initial phasing burns that we discussed a little earlier. Those five major burns that bring Dragon incrementally closer uh, to the International Space Station. Forward bulkhead uh, Dracos have done their uh, uh, job for the approach and rendezvous. We'll see him again uh, when Dragon leaves the International Space Station and the forward bulkhead Dracos are used uh, for a very significant maneuver, the deorbit burn. Uh, but for now, we'll use the service section Dracos uh, for the upcoming maneuvers, including uh, the approach zero, which is the maneuver right at the waypoint zero mark, 400 meters below the station, and approach one uh, that takes us right in front of the docking access inwards uh, to make contact with the International Space Station. Flight control teams working in tandem together. You're seeing the teams over in Hawthorne monitoring Dragon's performance, working with the crew inside. Great views of the International Space Station, only 500 meters away at this point, and you can start seeing the features that make it seem as though the Dragon is right underneath. We're almost there, about seven minutes away from waypoint zero. This is uh, about what 500 meters looks like. Right now we're over the North Indian Ocean. We're about to cross uh, the southern border of India here soon. Still in an orbital daylight, expecting that sunset in uh, a little less than 20 minutes.
the crew inside Dragon monitoring the performance. You can see in the middle screen there, uh, that point uh, at the very bottom, that's the Dragon spacecraft, and they're trying to meet uh, with that point right below the space station. And you can see what the maneuver is about to do. It's about to swing it uh, right at that point, right in front of the docking axis, the cone you see in the circle in the middle of that screen. Features of the International Space Station becoming a bit more prominent. The solar arrays on both wings of the space station to the left and to the right. The forward port where Dragon Freedom and the Axiom crew will be docking is at the very tip of uh, this view here. That is the node uh, 2 forward port, International Docking Adapter. Uh, Dragon again will swing uh, from this view from the bottom right out in front to meet with the docking axis. Commander Michael Lopez Alegria on the left of your screen, um, one of the four crew members inside Dragon Freedom, suited up, uh, ready to monitor these operations. Pilot Walter Villaday to the right. Alper Gezeracci uh, is also a mission specialist, as well as Marcus Want. The four crew members make up the Axiom 3, Axiom Mission 3 crew, headed to the International Space Station for a 14-day stay. Counting down five minutes to waypoint zero. 3.58 is the approximate time of uh, executing that uh, approach maneuver. Again, it's the service section, Dracos, on the outside of uh, the Dragon spacecraft that will take it, uh, that will be fired and uh, make sure that the Dragon converges to waypoint one, again, right in front of the International Space Station. Three and a half minutes to um, approach zero. That's the waypoint marker. We're getting views, continuing to get views from the ground stations providing uh, that video from the Dragon spacecraft and of course continuing to get great views from the International Space Station. We're now flying over India, right there you're seeing the southern coast of India, Station, Dragon uh, and two, International we're Space Station two. flying. We see range less than 400 meters in attitude as expected. Houston copies. As astronaut Laurel O'Hara confirming the data that she's seeing, again, from inside the International Space Station, she and uh, Jasmine Mogbelli, another NASA astronaut, monitoring Dragon's approach to the International Space Station, confirming the data that they're seeing on their screen.
external cameras on the International Space Station continuing to track Dragon Freedom. Still getting fantastic views as Dragon and International Space Station are flying over India. Dragon is inside 400 meters, just waiting for confirmation of that waypoint zero and approach zero maneuver. Both vehicles flying at uh, 17,500 miles per hour. And we're just seconds away from converging on waypoint zero, standing by for that approach maneuver. And confirmed, we're in approach zero now. Service section Dracos are firing, standing by for the performance of that approach maneuver. Dragon SpaceX on the big loop. Approach zero has started and the trajectory has converged on waypoint one. You can expect arrival at waypoint one at 1025 UTC. SpaceX Freedom Road Copy. And with that, the teams have confirmed a good approach zero. That was a good burn, and we're converged onto the next waypoint, waypoint one, being 220 meters right in front of the International Space Station. The read from the crew operations resource engineer to the crew aboard Dragon Freedom confirms that we're looking at 4.25 a.m. Central Time for that expected arrival time at waypoint one. Again, the teams have pulled a go-no-go -go for uh, passing those two waypoints, waypoint zero and waypoint one. So we'll see a maneuver very soon similar to what we've seen for waypoint zero, where when we reach that waypoint, the approach maneuver will be immediately executed, no hold uh, is expected. However, teams will continue to monitor their performance. Everything's looking good so far. With that, uh, we're just about 25 minutes away from that waypoint zero, so why don't we toss it back over to Hawthorne and check in with the teams over there, Kate and John. Thanks, Gary. For those of you that have just recently joined, we are tracking the um, approach and docking of Dragon with the AX-3 mission approaching the International Space Station. We do expect contact uh, to occur around 2.40 a.m. Pacific, um, so coming up in about 40 minutes from now. Um, everything is going really well so far. We are now uh, just uh, past the 400-meter mark, or waypoint zero, uh, heading toward the 220 meter mark waypoint one uh, and as Gary reported earlier the teams pulled yes to um, not have to stop at either of those waypoints those are opportunities for us to, if needed where we can stop there and reset and you know do whatever course corrections are necessary but good news we're able to cruise right through waypoint zero which is what just happened we're going to be able to go straight through waypoint one which as I mentioned is about 220 meters away so it's safe to say AX3 they're cruising this morning, uh, which is great. I'm sure that they are so excited. This journey has been about uh, 36 hours or so mm -hmm. yep. since they lifted off. Um, gosh, I guess that was 
not yesterday, but the day before. <laughs> and they lifted off at 4.49 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, so, yeah, about 36 hours they, they've been in Dragon, and I'm sure that they are very much looking forward to uh, beginning all the science and experiments oh, yeah. and everything that uh, they are about to embark on for about the next two weeks or so. You're absolutely right, Kate. I mean, this crew is ready with this mission. Uh, and as you mentioned, right, they're ready to do the science and the research. And we know how core that is to this mission, uh, this particular, these particular objectives. Um, and you really can't talk about spaceflight, human spaceflight missions without talking about mission patches. Oh, right? absolutely. Right? These mission patches are left behind as this lasting reminder of what occurred on the mission and what the crew was doing, and they end up everywhere, and they're definitely in that vehicle. Oh, yeah. And there's going to be more. <laughs> there's plenty on the International Space Station, and we have them all over our laptops and everywhere. So it's a really big deal for crew to be involved in designing that patch because it's such a lasting mark of their dedication and their hard work. So you'll often find a lot of the significance for them personally, and the nations that they represent. So let's take a look at the AX3 mission patch now. As you can see, their names, a star, and unique graphics for each nation are featured to highlight all four astronauts. With the commander, MLA, Michael Lopez Alegria, holding dual citizenship, the five national flags mark the top edge. The destination, the International Space Station, is the anchoring element in the middle. And what I love about this is that all four of them are pilots, and that that image of the uh, space station there looks like pilot wings. It's very cool. Yeah, I love that. On the bottom, you see the phrase plus ultra in Latin, which means further beyond, and this is the mission's motto. So all of this together builds on the patch's theme of exploration and its slogan, exploring further without borders. I love how each patch is personalized yeah. to the crew. Um, it's it's not just about designing something that yeah. looks cool, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, of course, everybody wants cool mission patches, but I, I just really appreciate when there's so much thought put behind the yeah. design. Yeah, it's an opportunity for crew to really think about, like, why are we doing this? Yeah. And what, is, what does this mean to us together? And you can see that in the AX3 patch. You can see it in all mission patches. That's what you hope to get out of it. Yeah, yeah. and like you mentioned, the reflection of it, they're all pilots. I just love that yeah. cohesive I know. Uh, reflected among them. Um, and, in, it speak, and in line with cohesiveness, uh, there are many teams supporting that four-person crew. Um, we can see here on our screen, they are getting closer and closer to the International Space Station, like we mentioned before. Um, they are, they passed waypoint zero, which is 400 meters away, so they are getting closer. But the, uh, the teams all around the globe that are supporting this mission, there are, there are critical people positions in each mm -hmm. of those places. Um, so here at uh, SpaceX Mission Control or MCCX, that's actually that's the view that you see there on your screen. This is the control center we have here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. We have a position called CORE, uh, which is the Crew Operations Resource Engineer. That is the voice of, um, uh, of communication to the, uh, actually there you see there, this is our CORE for today. Um, that is is uh, Celie Grossman, and she is the primary voice in communicating, really the only voice in communicating mm -hmm. from SpaceX ground to uh, to the crew, and uh, this position is is held all through all these dynamic phases of flight. Um, it's very similar to CAPCOM at Mission Control Houston, uh, which stands for Capsule Communicator. Um, that is basically ground to ISS. Uh, also over at uh, uh, Houston uh, Space Center, we have the flight director that sits next to Capcom. I'm actually here a live view um, of, of our flight control center excuse me, of the Flight Control Center at Mission Control Houston. Uh, this is where Gary is reporting from whenever we, we, we go back to him. Uh, but the flight director is because there next to Capcom, to, and that CBM person the leads the team through... Copy, Laurel. We'd like for you to kill it and restart it. And work. As I was mentioning, uh, next to Capcom is the flight director. That's the individual that leads the team through major milestones. Uh, there's also ADCO, that stands for uh, attitude, determination, and control officer. Uh, they handle controls, uh, attitude, orientation of the ISS. Uh, there's also VVO, the visiting vehicle officer. Uh, well, they how can we restart it? Just 
checking. Laurel, we're going to take that one for the ground. So stand by. So I believe that was Capcom. Uh, as I mentioned before, that is the primary voice from uh, Johnson Space Center here, Houston Mission Control to station. Um, and then, of course, there's uh, the flight surgeon, you know, keep continuing to talk about these key roles. Um, flight surgeon, it's basically, you know, the, the person that the crew regu regularly speaks to for uh, scheduled chances of medical conferences. So this is a standard part of space flight um, and where we're checking in on, on the crew and making sure that they're feeling well uh, and if they're not assisting them to make them feel better. Yeah, exactly right, Kate. And you, you might have heard us pausing there a few times, right? And that's to work with exactly what you mentioned, right? It's a single point of communication. Talking to crew is essential for all of these teams to be able to work together. And it's important to have groups like CORE, um, uh, disciplines like Capcom, to be those single points of voice so that crew and ground teams can work very efficiently together. Um, you know, without that, it, it wouldn't be as smooth as it is. And as we know, s slow is smooth, smooth is fast. And Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We've been, and, and that's part of what we're looking at today is watching this vehicle approach station. Um, it may seem a little slow at times, but it really is smooth and that's fast. And in addition to MCCH that you see on the screen, MCCA. Uh, is Axiom Space's Mission Control Center in Houston, Texas as well. MCCA is officially certified control center, joining the large network of other control centers supporting the ISS from all over the world. From this secure facility, teams have live access to voice, video, and data from the ISS and can work alongside their NASA counterparts and SpaceX counterparts to run on-orbit operations and monitor every aspect of the mission in real time, 24-7, for the duration of the crew's mission. And similar to like what you're mentioning, Kate, of having a single point inside these control rooms for Axiom, for MCCA, that room is led by Axel, or Axiom Operations Lead. And around the room that you see positioned around Axel are other supporting flight controller positions, each responsible for different aspects of mission support. For Axiom, that includes research, communications, medical, integration and stowage, and timeline operations. So when you put all this together, this is really a significant step in terms of getting to low Earth orbit and sustaining low Earth orbit because it's the 12th ground segment partner for the ISS program. And with this facility, we're providing our customers and the global community a front row seat to the work being done on station. So you were talking about comms. Uh, I just like for those that might not be familiar, just a quick, quick, <laughs> a quick rundown um, of what that is that we're hearing. We often start with the Quindar tone, mm -hmm. which is that uh, unmistakably unique sound. Beep. Yeah, yep. Yep. Um, and so that is the indicator that some sort of comms is going to occur. So we try to really listen for that. And as yeah. soon as we hear it, we try to go quiet to make room for those comms. Um, you then also hear uh, something like. Like uh, Dragon Houston um, on on the big loop. Right. Um, so that is the standard protocol of basically saying, um, "This is the person I'm calling. I'm calling from this place on whatever net it is." So in that case, it would be uh, I. Uh, a flight controller, or in that case, in the example I gave, uh, forgive me, it is 2 at 10 in the morning here, so <laughs> my brain might be a little slow, but um, it is, I, if I would be Capcom in Houston, I would say Dragon Houston on the big net saying, basically saying, hey, Dragon, I'm trying to get a hold of you, who I am, I'm, I'm in Houston, and, uh, and what net we're talking on. So a yeah. um, little bit of clarification there on, on why you don't just hear the Quindar tone and then someone saying, hey, uh, we have, um, you know, you know, something floating around in the cabin or, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, and all of these things for supporting missions like this, it's really important for everybody to kind of know what role they play when. Yeah. And I think that's one of absolutely. the things that I absolutely love about these kind of dynamic operations, right? It's, as we mentioned, if you, the, if you move slow, you move, you, you move smooth. And if you move smooth, you move fast. For and sure. having procedures to help you do that and a training that backs everybody up, right? It's not just crew that trains for these missions. It's all of those yep. flight controllers that we mentioned in Houston, in SpaceX, at Axiom. All of those flight controllers need to know what role they play and when they play it. Absolutely. And 
knowing that knows allows you to understand, okay, at this critical moment in this flight path, it's my role to kind of lead the team. Mm -hmm. It's my role to do the communication. And now it's my role to follow For on sure. the team. And I think that's just absolutely amazing part of space flight. So in the capsule, uh, the, our four, four person crew of Axiom 3, they are on their way to the International Space Station. Uh, we are coming up to waypoint one, which is 220 meters away from the station. Uh, the crew are seated. They are are buckled in, they have their suits on, they've gone through. Um, actually, uh, I'm not sure if they have completed the leak check yet. I'll check on that. Um, but they will be completing uh, a leak check on the spacesuit. Um, and I am hearing that, that they did complete that leak check and it was successful, so that's good news. Um, but those spacesuits are really important. You know, we heard us mention before that uh, we have the crew wear them during the more dynamic phases of flight, and that's because those suits protect the crew from depressurization events. Um, the suit inflates with uh, nitrox, which is a nitrogen-oxygen mixture, uh, and they are flame-resistant. So um, cool visual here kind of illustrating it. They are custom uh, to each astronaut. It's a single-piece suit. The helmets, which are actually 3D printed, um, are also, I, I would love to put one of these on one day. They look so cool. <laughs> um, they also, of course, have boots and gloves. Those are all attached. They also have a quick disconnect or a QD, uh, which is located on the right thigh um, uh, umbilical. That is what provides that nitrox uh, flow, airflow, as well as where the electronics are connected. Um, and that is important because within the helmet, there is uh, a mounted mic as well as their in-ear speakers. Mm. So that's where all of that communications um, uh, connections occur is that umbilical. Uh, and, you, you know, we were talking about training before and how they practice uh, suiting up, although we mentioned suiting up in space would be a little bit well, different, yeah. but uh, they are able to actually suit up in less than 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, and so the crew practices that. Um, this suit is an IVA or intravehicular activity suit, meaning it's designed for use only inside of Dragon. The suits will stay on uh, Dragon while the crew is is living on the International Space Station, the suits that they will use for their extravehicular activity or EVAs, uh, aka spacewalks, there are designated suits for those EVAs, known as EVA suits. Um, and uh, the amount of time that they spend in suits varies. Um, as we mentioned before, they wear them during launch, but then whenever we did the on-orbit event with the crew, the day before yesterday, uh, it uh, you know an hour and a half after they lifted off, we had an opportunity to chat with them, and they had already taken their suits off and were in their comfort garments. So um, ultimately, they have they they have to take everything they need with them in order to be fully self-contained in the Dragon. Um, and yeah, ultimately speaking, the suits are are not only do they look cool, they are super functional, and most importantly, they are safe. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's nice to see. Um, you know, we don't have the view at the moment. As we mentioned, we're going to lose the views here and there. So when we have the view, um, we'll, be we'll be sure to bring it back. Um, that, uh, the view of hopefully uh, all four of them sit seated in their seats um, and we'll be able to see those suits uh, in action. So with that being said, uh, let's actually check back in with Gary over in Houston uh, for the latest progress with the approach to the International Space Station. Hey, thank you, Kate. Thank you, John. Yeah, we're monitoring uh, inside 10 minutes from uh, reaching that waypoint one. Now, the teams uh, in Hawthorne and in Houston are currently talking through some options. Uh, we talked about passing that waypoint one. That's still uh, part of the plan. But right now, we're under active discussions to potentially hold outside of the keep out sphere. Now, that waypoint one is 220 meters in front of the docking access. Uh, about 180 meters is right at the cusp of that keep out sphere. Uh, the teams uh, may elect to command a hold right around uh, that area just to assess that everything's in tip-top shape before they proceed. Uh, so again, we're tracking uh, inside 10 minutes, uh, about nine minutes uh, from reaching that waypoint one. Uh, the plan is to execute the approach one maneuver. That's just firing the Draco uh, thrusters to proceed into the docking axis. But instead of crossing into the keep out sphere, we'll go ahead and command a hold at uh, about 180 meters. So we're still following along, still gathering the data. Teams are still discussing, but uh, we are good to proceed past waypoint one, uh, and we'll continue to discuss.
you're looking at now are the teams inside Mission Control Houston, the International Space Station Flight Control Teams. Of course, teams uh, on both uh, on, on different areas of the uh, United States here in Houston and, of course, in Hawthorne, California. The teams here monitoring the International Space Station. Every position you see here staffed is monitoring a different component and contributing information and data and monitoring, making sure everything's good to the flight director. Uh, flight director Judd Freeling is leading the teams today in coordination with the mission director in Hawthorne, California, a joint operation indeed. Uh, the two flight control centers are working in tandem with the two spacecraft in flight in low Earth orbit. Uh, that's the International Space Station being controlled out of this room you see here in uh, Houston, as well as the Dragon controlled from Hawthorne. You see the uh, screens at the front of the room are a little bit dim. We're right now in an orbital nighttime uh, as we continue to orbit the Earth 260 statute miles over the North uh, Pacific Ocean. And copy, Dragon, and for your awareness, uh, we are going to proceed past waypoint one, and then the ground will be commanding a hold at 180 meters in order to work some ISS solar array configuration. We will hold at 180 meters and be advised that in your last transmission we picked up an echo. Copy Dragon, understand you're reporting an echo, and that's correct. The ground will be commanding a hold post waypoint one. Hey, for what it's worth, the echo just disappeared in that transmission. And we're getting views from inside the Dragon cabin. It was Michael Lopez Alegria, the voice from inside Dragon Freedom, commander of the Axiom crew. He's confirming uh, what we uh, did report and the flight teams did discuss, uh, proceeding past waypoint one and commanding a hold. Teams working in tandem uh, just to make sure everything's in tip-top shape before uh, continuing to press on. Again, we're in an orbital uh, nighttime right now over the North Pacific Ocean. Expecting, uh, expect a sunrise here uh, at uh, about 4.45 a.m. Uh, Central Time. Once the teams hold, we'll continue to uh, keep in touch with the flight control teams and share the latest on docking times and uh, status of the crew. For now, uh, we do have waypoint one uh, and the trajectory converging on that mile marker uh, just inside five minutes. Just as a recap, the plan is to proceed past waypoint one, as has, uh, the teams have agreed on. Uh, that's an approach one maneuver, just firing the Draco service, uh, the service section Draco thrusters to push inwards on, uh, right alongside the docking axis. This is directly in front of the docking port. Uh, but there is, uh, there is uh, sort of an imaginary line around there called the keep-out sphere, which is about at the 180-meter mark. Uh, the plan right now is to proceed past waypoint one at 220 meters, proceed inwards to about 180 meters, and command a hold. From inside the Dragon cabin, you can see sort of the trajectory. Uh, when you look at these trajectories uh, and this, from the displays inside Dragon, uh, what is being calculated in real time are different breakout maneuvers. Uh, but right now the plan is uh, to uh, proceed uh, past waypoint one and uh, go ahead and command that hold. 
you can sort of see, uh, though it is in a slightly lower resolution, you can sort of see the docking light on the forward end of Dragon. Uh, it has this pulsing phenomenon, and as it pulses, is illuminating uh, the International Space Station. What you're seeing is the forward end of the space station, so the docking port is coming into view as we're almost three minutes from that docking axis. It's the forward port, but the docking light itself is illuminating the outside of the station as we continue over in an orbital nighttime over the Pacific Ocean. Now we're listening into the flight control teams. Uh, wanted to report some rationale. Again, we're proceeding uh, past waypoint one, about two minutes from now. This 10 minutes allows uh, this, the uh, Spartan console here in Mission Control Houston. Spartan is responsible for power and thermal uh, monitoring of the space station systems, looking at some uh, temperature fluctuations in the solar arrays, just wanting those to dampen out just a tad. Uh, and so we can expect Dragon to hold. SpaceX on the big loop, noting approach one and soft capture ring extension will begin shortly and then we ground will command the hold ahead of 150 meters and a reminder that manual impulsive retreat recovery is not permitted. Copy all SpaceX. Crew Operations Resource Engineer in Hawthorne, California, reiterating the plan uh, to the Axiom crew inside Dragon. Again, we're proceeding past waypoint one and holding uh, just outside 180 meters. Uh, Right now, the plan is uh, there's uh, the Spartan is m uh, monitoring um, some temperature fluctuations on the ISS solar arrays. Should just be a couple of minutes. Right now, we're looking at approximately 10 to 15, though we'll monitor real time and uh, provide uh, data as we get more from the teams and they provide their assessment uh, just to make sure that uh, everything's in tip-top shape like, like we have been reporting uh, to go ahead and proceed into the keep-out spear. Uh, but the teams are just looking for just a little bit more time to gather that data before saying, before giving the all clear uh, to proceed inwards. Again, towards waypoint two is the next milestone, uh, holding at just outside 180 meters. Once they proceed in, uh, the next milestone will be waypoint two. Uh, teams will conduct a go-no-go -go poll uh, on whether to go ahead and hold or proceed inwards again. Uh, we'll check in and continue to check in with the teams to monitor Dragon's progress for docking uh, later this morning. And we pass through waypoint one, holding for confirmation of that approach one performance. 214 meters in closing. We see vehicle mode approach to alarm point moving to step three. Houston copies.
Continuing to listen into the loops here in Mission Control, Houston, coordinating with the teams over in Mission Control, Hawthorne. Dragon SpaceX on the big loop. The solar array configuration has been completed, so we will be proceeding with approach one and no hold. Then path is no hold. And right on time, the teams, uh, instead of uh, commanding that hold at about 180 meters, right uh, right at about the 185-meter mark, station, we lane that we are continuing on for. Dragon in the corridor, attitude as expected. Houston copies. From inside the International Space Station, Laurel O'Hara monitoring Dragon's uh, approach with her, uh, it's called Rendezvous Proximity Operations Panel. Uh, this is providing data to inside the International Space Station, reporting the same data that we're seeing on the ground. We're now inside 180 meters, proceeding inside the key belt sphere. Uh, the next milestone will be Waypoint 2. Teams will continue to assess the vehicle's performance throughout its uh, progress inwards towards that next milestone uh, and conduct a go-no-go -no -go poll to proceed past that waypoint towards docking. Uh, that go-no-go -no -go poll expected to begin in approximately six minutes. They may elect to do it a little bit early, uh, but everything uh, proceeding even better uh, than we were expecting that... Uh, uh, uh, monitoring of the ISS solar array seemed to resolve itself, so we're pressing inwards. Everything looking good here from inside Mission Control Houston, but again, we're not the only game in town. Mission Control Houston you see on the right, uh, working in tandem uh, with the teams on the left. With that, why don't we check in with Kate and John over in Hawthorne. Kate and John. Thank you very much, Gary. You know, that was a great example of how you can hear things change dynamically in flight. And with proper training, flight controllers know how to assess their systems and their configurations and make a call on it and move forward. Absolutely. I They're the experts. That. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, and crew also has been training quite a bit. And in addition to their training for systems like that, uh, they're also training for their research. So this crew in particular is going to be participating in over 30 different scientific efforts over the course of their two weeks on the orbiting laboratory. So let's go ahead and highlight three from each of the countries who are flying today. First up is the Italian research portfolio. The ISOC system, developed by the Italian Air Force, provides an updated space object catalog and state-of-the-art algorithms for space Station, events. Houston, on the big loop, can you confirm you are ready for docking? Sensation, we are ready for docking. With that, at waypoint two, Dragon will briefly pause to align for docking, then automatically resume approach. We had heard some good news there. We got the uh, we heard that the teams pulled mm -hmm. go for docking. So excellent news for the AX3 crew. Yeah, exactly. All right, and with that, the ISOC command and control software utilize. Utilize the Italian and the Italian Air Force SSA or Space Space Situational Awareness Center as a European hub for assessing re-entry and fragmentation of space objects. The ISOC services for ISS project is a proof of concept experiment aimed at demonstrating how, in future space missions such as Cislunar or Martian, astronauts could be able to obtain near real-time conjunction analysis with limited support from Earth ground segments or even autonomously. Dragon SpaceX on the big loop, soft capture ring extension is complete. SpaceX Freedom, we're top. Good news there, that soft capture mechanism is what will make initial contact with the space station when Dragon uh, is, you know, close enough to touch the station. <laughs> And the Turkish Space Agency also has a broad range of scientific efforts for this mission, starting with Uzman. Algae have many properties that make them ideal organisms to support humans during long duration spaceflight missions. Not only could they serve as a nutritional source included in astronaut menus, algae could also remove carbon dioxide and produce oxygen for spacecraft environmental control systems, help regulate spacecraft temperatures, recycle certain wastes, and even act as a source of fuel. The data generated from this experiment will be used to advance the development of 
microalgal life support systems for space missions and could impact the design of future carbon dioxide capture, oxygen conversion, wastewater treatment systems, and provide fertilizer options for other agricultural crops grown in space. And also highlighting the scientific efforts from ESA and the Swedish Space Agency, let's start with Memo BC. This experiment aims to determine the direct and delayed post-flight effects on the neural stem, on neural stem cells, sorry, after long-term microgravity exposure, and investigate if the delayed effects are the result of genetic changes emerging during microgravity, or to be secreted components in the medium during flight. Dragon Freedom, SpaceX on the big loop. Please confirm that you are ready for final approach and visors are down. MCCX and Houston have pulled go for docking. Six Freedom, confirm all four crew visors down. We're ready for docking. Copy Dragon, go for docking. Ground will be enabling approach shortly. And a reminder, once you're inside the crew hands-off point, retreat and breakout are not permitted. Copy. All right, so there on your screen, on the right-hand side of your screen, is our crew operations and resource engineer, or SpaceX core, uh, for tonight. That is Celie Grossman. We heard great news being given to the AX3 crew. Uh, they are Their visors are now down, and the teams in Houston are uh, ready for them to begin docking. So things are starting to get very exciting. This is basically what everything has been leading to for the last 36 hours. So we're very excited for the AX3 AX3 crew to get closer and closer to what will be their home for up to the next 14 days. Uh, with that, let's go back over to Gary Jordan, who is at Johnson Space Center uh, and, and tracking the final movements of Dragon Freedom. Thank you, Kate. Uh, right on time, we're about two minutes away from Waypoint 2's arrival. Uh, the teams here in Mission Control Houston have worked in tandem with the teams over in Hawthorne. Both teams have pulled go uh, to proceed uh, past Waypoint 2 for docking. Now in this scenario, instead of a commanded hold at the Waypoint 2 marker, which is 20 meters away from the International Space Station, the Dragon will make a brief pause at that Waypoint 2 mark, again 20 meters, only for a short couple of seconds just to reconfigure its software to change for docking mode. Uh, so it'll pause there for just a brief couple of seconds and then proceed inwards for docking. That is coming up very shortly. We're just about 40 meters away from the International Space Station now and closing. It's an orbital nighttime, so we're only going to see the um, navigation lights and, and docking light uh, blinking once we get views from the International Space Station teams here in Mission Control Houston monitoring from the perspective of the International Space Station and the joint operations with the teams over in Hawthorne. Flight control teams reporting that the rate uh, of approach is as expected. Everything's going well. And again, the teams have pulled go to proceed past waypoint two, coming up in about 10 meters. We're inside 30 meters. Not only are the teams you see here monitoring the approach of Dragon Freedom and the Axiom crew inside to the International Space Station, we also have NASA astronauts Laurel O'Hara and Jasmine Mogbelli inside the International Space Station monitoring the approach as well. Now getting some views of Dragon. In the orbital nighttime, you can see those service section Dracos firing to keep its attitude right on the docking axis and its range rate as expected. 
green starboard light and uh, red port light, navigation lights on the forward end of Dragon coming into view. Again, we are in an orbital nighttime, so it is a bit dark. Those specks you see in the frame are uh, dead pixels from the radiation on the uh, camera. Confirmed waypoint to arrival. Dragon is now pausing and reconfiguring for its approach to the docking port. Station Houston on the big loop. Drag is on final approach and is go for docking. Monitor for steps five and six and one decimal one zero two. Dragon approach and retreat monitoring. Station copies. We see vehicle mode approach to docking port range decreasing. We copy. Waypoint 2 pause is over, and we're proceeding with final approach. Now inside 18 meters from the International Space Station. Copy. Laurel O'Hara, NASA astronaut in the International Space Station, monitoring the approach. As the vehicle is just 15 meters away from the International Space Station, where she resides, seeing the range rate, the rate of approach to dock with the International Space Station being as expected inside 15 meters and closing. little inside 13 meters. The range rate continues to decrease. That's as expected. Flight controllers are estimating just inside three minutes from contact with the International Space Station. Freedom is at 10 meters. Copy 10. Dragon Commander Michael Lopez Alegria confirming inside at 10 meters. Dragon continuing its approach as expected. We may see a brief handover, a loss of video for just a couple of seconds and regain it. There's a chance we'll have it continuously through this, but if we do lose it, we will expect to regain it back by the time of contact. Five meters. Copy five meters. Inside five meters at the two meter mark, we may hear the call out chop, crew hands off procedure. At that point, the crew cannot command an abort. Everything looking good though. Inside four meters. Copy two. Loss of signal as expected.
Dragon SpaceX soft capture confirmed. You heard that call out from the crew operations resource engineer in Hawthorne, California, 442 AM Central Time. Dragon Freedom has made contact and soft capture with the International Space Station as the two were flying together 262 statute miles over the South Pacific Ocean. Ring retraction in progress. With a good soft capture, the ring is now retracting, pulling Dragon closer in with the International Docking Adapter aboard the International Space Station. This is part of a series of steps to formally hard mate the uh, Dragon to the International Space Station after the soft capture ring is fully retracted and bringing the Dragon inwards. There is a series of 12 hooks that will secure Dragon to the International Space Station for what's called a hard dock. After that, the umbilical will be deployed, uh, providing power and communications and data between the Dragon and the International Space Station. This is the docking sequence. Once umbilical is extended and mated, the docking sequence is complete. Again, that soft capture time where Dragon made contact and a soft capture with the International Space Station, 442 AM Central Time. Station and Dragon were 262 statute miles over the South Pacific Ocean. Ring retraction proceeding as expected, getting views from one of the cameras on the Japanese exposed facility on the forward end of the space station, seeing the starboard side of the Dragon. As we continue to uh, monitor the progress of this ring retraction, now getting some sun illuminating the nadir or earth-facing side, and now the whole thing of Dragon Freedom. Sun is rising over the uh, South Pacific Ocean as Dragon and International Space Station continue to fly on a southeastern trajectory. Flight controllers monitoring the ring retraction and the alignment uh, with the international docking adapter to proceed with driving those hooks. Uh, they'll be driven in uh, two sets, gangs of six, a uh, total of 12 hooks. They'll be driven again six at a time. The rated hook indicators are starting to form green, uh, showing some good alignment, still tracking. Dragon SpaceX on the big loop. Ring retraction is complete. Docking sequence is holding for MCS reconfiguration. Good milestone. The ring retraction is complete. We're seeing good alignment. This is quite a dance. It's not just the Dragon performing some of these maneuvers to secure Dragon to the International Space Station. The International Space Station itself performing a series of attitude control configurations uh, to prepare for the hard docking sequence. Once station's attitude control is configured properly, we'll go ahead and proceed towards the hard docking and driving those hooks.
the teams you see here uh, in Houston on the right and Hawthorne, California on the left work together to bring Dragon to the International Space Station. We're still going through the docking sequence uh, to formally mate uh, the Dragon with the International Space Station. We're seeing good alignment with that ring retraction and uh, looking forward to proceeding to that hard dock and driving those hooks. Again, 4.42 a.m. Central Time was when we made contact and soft capture with the International Space Station. Dragon Freedom coming more clearly into view. Station Houston on the big loop, MCS configured, proceeding with hook driving. Station copies. Attitude control configured on the International Space Station side. We're just using the control mum and gyros for this sequence. With the station in the proper attitude, we can proceed towards uh, driving those hooks. Again, we're going to do them six at a time, total of 12 hooks. Once both set of hooks are traveling and have secured, uh, that'll complete the hard docking sequence, and then we'll deploy that umbilical. The first set of six hooks are currently driving. We can expect the hooks to drive uh, about two minutes apart from one another. A whole, holistically, we're looking at about four minutes of driving hooks. Again, six at a time. Stand by for the hook's performance. But it should be just a, f a few moments until we complete that hard dock. Again, that's not the end of the docking sequence. After a hard dock, we'll deploy the umbilical. Uh, between the Dragon and the International Space Station. This provides data and uh, power between the two vehicles. Dragon, up to this point, during its flight after launching on January 18th, has been relying on its batteries and the solar arrays you see on the trunk of the vehicle. That's the black part that you see on the space-facing side, gathering power as it continues to orbit the Earth. Once those umbilicals are deployed, uh, they'll be relying on the station's power, gathering power from the station's solar arrays. Hooks continuing to drive, seeing a good seal on the international docking adapter interface. Again, those first set of hooks are continuing to drive. Teams are seeing a uh, good set of first hooks. Those uh, first set of hooks have driven and have closed. Now the second set of hooks are driving. Again, 12 in total. So the first six have been secured. The next six are driving. That'll complete the hard dock of Dragon to the International Space Station. One more step after that, deploying that umbilical.
Again, we have a soft capture of Dragon Freedom to the International Space Station. That was at uh, 4.42 a.m. Central Time. We're now in the hard dock sequence. Twelve hooks uh, are used to secure Dragon. The uh, first set of hooks... The first set of hooks have driven, Dragon and we just heard that hard second hook. capture hooks. is complete. So 12 hooks, uh, all deployed, all securing Dragon for a hard dock to the International Space Station. One more step to complete the docking sequence, deploying that umbilical. In the meantime, with a hard dock that does secure the Dragon to the International Space Station, they don't have to be as careful with the loads imparting on the inside. Typically during this sequence, they uh, have what's called an exercise constraint. So the astronauts on board station, all seven of them are not allowed to exercise during that time. So there's no oscillation, no vibration. They've just lifted that constraint for the crew inside so they can get uh, on with their workout. In the meantime, we're still standing by for the deployment of the umbilical on Dragon to complete the docking sequence. Station on two, we are stepping out of Dragon Approach Monitoring. Stand copies and concurs. Welcome to Space Station Axiom 3. Looking forward to seeing you soon. Thanks, Laura. We're excited to get started. With all hooks driven, Laurel O'Hara and Jasmine Mogbelli inside the space station are relieved of their monitoring duties, welcoming the crew to the space station. The soft capture ring has been stowed, all 12 hooks are driven, and the umbilical is now deploying. We are almost done with the docking sequence. And Dragon Freedom, this is SpaceX. Docking sequence is complete, and the ground will be enabling hardline power and comm connections shortly. You are go to dock your suits per procedure 4.012, and we'll go ahead and make sure cameras are external. 4.010, And copy Dragon, just to note that's 4.012. And with that, Dragon Freedom and the Axiom Mission 3 crew inside has formally docked to the International Space Station. The docking sequence is complete. After completing a capture and soft dock at 4.42 a.m. Central Time, all 12 hooks have secured Dragon to the station. The umbilical has been deployed. Laura O'Hara and Jasmine Mogbelli have been released of their duties. The crew inside is able to exercise. Uh, inside the space station is able to exercise. And the crew inside Dragon is able to doff their suits or take off their suits. The dynamic portion of docking uh, and the safeguard needed for those suits is complete. Uh, the Dragon uh, crew it will now doff their suits and prepare uh, for entering the station uh, in just about uh, approximately an hour and a half. Uh, maybe maybe some change, but we're looking at a hatch open.
the Axiom Mission 3 crew's arrival to the International Space Station, but based on current planning, uh, that is what we are planning for. After hatches are uh, opened, uh, the crew members of Expedition 70 uh, will welcome the Axiom Mission 3 crew uh, to the International Space Station, and the uh, cadre of 11 uh, will gather for a welcome ceremony uh, to begin their 14-day stay, their journey aboard the International Space Station. Again, teams in uh, control rooms on the uh, International Space Station Flight Control Room on the right and SpaceX Flight Control Team on the left in Hawthorne, California, working in tandem to bring the Axiom Mission 3 crew to the International Space Station docking uh, at 4.42 a.m. Central Time. Now, with the docking sequence complete, uh, the, the crew and the teams will make steps uh, to bring the Axiom Mission 3 crew inside the International Space Station. One of the primary things that will happen over the next hour and a half before the hatches are opened is there is a space in between the Dragon Hatch and the International Space Station Hatch called the Vestibule, currently at vacuum. We need to bring that up to the equalize the pressure between Dragon and the station, uh, about what we find at sea level, 14.7 uh, pounds per square inch. That uh, process will take some time, introducing air and making sure uh, there are no temperature fluctuations and we're getting a good read uh, to make sure there are no leaks uh, as we methodically bring the pressure up from vacuum up to 14.7 PSI. SpaceX Freedom on the big loop, comp check from the cabin mic. And Dragon SpaceX, we've got you loud and clear on the cabin mic. We'll hear these periodic check-ins from the crew as they make their way through the process of doffing or taking off their suits and getting ready to open up the hatches, configuring the inside of the Dragon Cabin uh, for uh, eventual uh, ingress and welcome into the International Space Station. Cabin Mike uh, being Station inside Houston the Dragon, the outside the suit. And PMA ingress. Two. Hey, Laurel, we give you a go for 2.102, step 1.1, one one, and step 2.2. Two. Uh, Houston, Houston, Houston, Houston, Houston, Houston, Houston, Houston, Houston, Houston, Houston, Houston, Houston, Now, from inside the International Space Station, you're hearing uh, Laurel O'Hara re um, repeating some of the steps on her end. Uh, after uh, taking on the job of monitoring the spacecraft's approach and docking to the International Space Station, she now moves on to the methodical steps of opening up the hatch and preparing uh, the International Space Station for the entry of new crew members. Uh, there are several hatches she'll have to open and uh, uh, areas she'll have to prepare uh, in order to welcome the crew. There are two hatches uh, that she'll have to work with. First is the no two forward hatch uh, that has been currently closed through the docking operations. That just allows her and the International Space Station crew access to the pressurized mating adapter. It's really a channel to get us all the way down to what's called the A-pass hatch. Uh, this is the hatch 
uh, that on the other side is that vestibule currently at vacuum. Uh, so she'll be opening up those hatches and preparing the pressurized mating adapter. Uh, she'll put some covers on some of the hatches just to minimize bumps uh, and uh, hazards along the way so the crew can ing ingress uh, safely into the International Space Station for hugs and handshakes later. Uh, we, If uh, we stick with the timeline, we're expecting that hatch to open in just about an hour and a half, 6.30 a.m. Central Time, but again, we'll continue to monitor the crew through on their the steps. And Dragon SpaceX, on the big loop, if desired, you can reference your procedure 4.400 for monitoring vestibule pressurization. Okay, 4.400. It'll be Laurel O'Hara on the uh, on the station side performing some of the steps for vestibule pressurization, but the crew operations resource engineer in Hawthorne reading up to the Axiom crew inside Dragon, which you see on your screen, they're able to monitor along as well. That vestibule is that important gap in between the Dragon hatch and the station hatch. Right now, at vacuum, will take uh, quite a bit to bring up to pressurization, 14.7 PSI. It's a slow With you on two. and methodical process. Forward hatches open. Houston copies. Wasting no time, Laurel O'Hara has confirmed that from inside the International Space Station, that no two forward hatches open. Again, that just allows Laurel some access to the pressurized mating adapter. This is the channel way that brings her to the A pass hatch. Now, that hatch will not be opened until that vestibule is pressurized. So with access to the pressurized mating adapter, she'll be able to work through the steps uh, to start the vestibule pressurization. Again, it's a methodical process. So it, uh, from vacuum, it's brought up to a checkpoint at five pounds per square inch. Uh, and is uh, once that pressure is uh, monitored for just a bit and looks stable to make sure there are no initial leaks, they'll go ahead and introduce air into that vestibule to pressurize it to equalize with the International Space Station and Dragon at 14.7 PSI. Meanwhile, inside the Dragon Axiom crew is doffing or taking off their suits. Uh, they'll uh, be changing into their garments and setting the Dragon cabin in such a configuration that it is ready for them to ingress the International Space Station. Laurel O'Hara getting a jump start on that vestibule pressurization, already starting some of the initial work, again, to bring that vestibule pressure up to 14.7 PSI.
quick recap, uh, Dragon Freedom and the AX-3 crew have arrived at the International Space Station docking at 4.42 a.m. Central Time. Dragon has been hard docked and the docking sequence is complete. Umbilicals are mated and hooks are driven to secure Dragon to the International Space Station. Crew inside is uh, doffing their suits and preparing for ingressing the International Space Station. It will take some time, though. On the other side, on the International Space Station side, Laurel O'Hara is preparing the uh, International Space Station and the vestibule in between the hatches of Dragon and Space Station uh, to bring it up to pressure. She's already opened up the forward hatch on the uh, Node 2. There's Dragon also another hatch. On the big loop, ISS power connection is established and our vestibule leak check is in progress. This next freedom wake up. So that confirmation uh, confirms that the link uh, enabled by the umbilical between Dragon and International Space Station is providing good power, good data, looks secure. Um, in addition, Laura O'Hara has again opened up that node 2 forward hatch and has begun the vestibule pressurization. Um, this is a methodical process, so the first step is to bring it up to about five pounds per square inch uh, and leave it there as a hold uh, to uh, make sure uh, that it is not leaking. This is the leak check uh, in its methodical uh, process of bringing up to pressure. We're shooting for 14.7 pounds per square inch. That's what will equalize uh, the vestibule between the uh, station and Dragon. Uh, currently enjoying pressures uh, of what uh, typically what we see here at sea level on Earth. Again, that vestibule pressurization leak check is underway.
For those just joining, we are continuing our coverage of Axiom Mission 3 crew's arrival to the International Space Station. The teams are methodically working to pressurize the vestibule um, and uh, open up the hatches to welcome the Axiom crew to the International Space Station. Quick recap, the uh, crew arrived the Axiom Mission 3 crew arrived at the International Space Station, making contact and soft capture at 4.42 a.m. Central Time. At the time, the Dragon and Station were flying together 262 statute miles over the South Pacific Ocean. The soft capture ring uh, retracted, bringing the Dragon in towards the International Docking Adapter and after a good alignment, drove 12 hooks to secure Dragon uh, tightly to the International Space Station for a hard dock. The umbilical was deployed between the Dragon the and the International Space Station. With you on the big loop. Just wondering with the uh, delay in docking, do you have an update for the time of the events coming up, the joint events? All right, Mike. Um, can't give you the best estimate right now. Uh, what we recommend is getting with the station crew uh, and talking it over and let us know when you're ready. minutes left. This is Mission Control Houston standing by monitoring the chatter here uh, and the progress of the vestibule leak checks and the crew's progress of welcoming the Axiom Mission 3 astronauts aboard the International Space Station. We're looking at uh, about another Dragon minute. Dragon SpaceX on the big loop, just looking for a status on suit doffing and if you've gotten into suit drying yet. Uh, seats one and four are out of their seats and out of their suits, and both suits are drying. Seat three just egress the seats and will be doffing here shortly. All right, copy that, Mike. Thanks.
So a quick status on the crew's progress of uh, opening up those hatches. That communication you just heard was from the crew operations resource engineer in Hawthorne with the mission control teams and with uh, SpaceX in California. Uh, we're asking for a status from the Axiom Mission 3 crew. Uh, they are partway through their suit doffing, meaning taking off their suits and drying. They hang them out uh, and make sure that the water uh, is released. Uh, making some good progress there. In the meantime, on the space station side here in Houston, monitoring that vestibule leak check. When the um, vestibule pressure is brought up from vacuum to five pounds per square inch, there's a, a period uh, where the teams allow for temperature fluctuations to dampen um, in order to have a good leak check. There's a little bit of oscillation, so uh, allowing time to pass and allowing the temperature to sort of equal out uh, allows the team to set a clock for approximately 15 minutes, monitor the uh, pressure inside the uh, vestibule, make sure it is good to go, and then after the 15 minute mark, proceed with uh, uh, bumping that vestibule pressure all the way up to equalize with the International Space Station. Teams working together uh, here in the United States in Houston, Texas on the right, International Space Station flight control teams um, and NASA's Johnson Space Center monitoring uh, the International Space Station and the uh, pressurization of the vestibule between that spacecraft and Dragon Freedom, welcoming Axiom Mission 3 astronauts to the International Space Station. We're working in Station tandem Houston, with the teams over in Hawthorne. And leak check. Hey, Laurel, leak check is still in work. We're going to need another 10 minutes. The Capcom here in Houston, William Vu, um, talking with Laurel Hera, who is uh, working on the vestibule leak check. It's holding at about five pounds per square inch, but we're just taking some time to evaluate and make sure that data is good to go and that there are indeed no leaks um, as we continue, uh, before we continue uh, with the pressurization of that vestibule up to equalize with the pressure of the International Space Station. Now, as we're waiting for those leak checks and waiting for some good data, again, we're working in tandem with the teams over in Hawthorne, California. The Dragon flight control teams uh, brought the Axiom Mission 3 crew from launch all the way to rendezvous and dock with the International Space Station. Let's check in with the teams over there with Kate and John. 
Thanks so much, Gary. Great words there. And it's safe to say now that 37 hours after they lifted off from Kennedy Space Center, the AX-3 crew has arrived at the International Space Station, as you can see there on your screen. Uh, I'm sure that they will all be very eager to oh, yeah. have that hatch opened in uh, just a little while. Uh, in order to get here over the last 37 hours, the Dragon capsule executed a number of burns in order to chase down the International Space Station. Um, you know, from lifting off at Kennedy Space Center uh, and then reaching the station as we see it now, a number of things occurred, including uh, basically those orbital maneuvers in order to get to the station uh, and approach it in a very... Uh, slow, calm, choreographed manner as we have seen over the last couple hours. Uh, the crew also had the opportunity to tune in with us and do an on-orbit mm -hmm. event um, about only 90 minutes after they yeah, took off. very quick. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and really, this is just the beginning of their mission. Um, they're they're, they're going to be here for up to 14 days. Oh, yeah, and it's going to be a packed mission, Kate. Uh, over the course of the next 14 days, the crew will be heavily focused on payload and research operations. This is the core of their mission. In fact, that's over 230 hours of combined research efforts. So much. It is. <laughs> and what's really cool about it is like, we know that payload utilization is such a commodity on station, and this gives an opportunity for research agencies, governments, to really get that dedicated time from these crew members. That's really, really important to them. Um, but additionally, you know, crew's also going to be heavily involved in the arts outreach. And I'm so excited for that. I am too. <laughs> I, I love that aspect of spaceflight. It's an essential part of human spaceflight and expeditions, and I'm really excited about it. And in addition, a lot of public outreach and engagement, because after all, as we've mentioned, this is Turkey's first flight. So this is going to be a packed mission for the crew. It's going to be an exciting mission for the crew. There's tons of research that's going to be going on over the next two uh, uh, next two weeks on ISS. And really, this is the goal of um, ultimately these private astronaut missions, right? Yeah. Commercializing space. You need this kind of energy put into a very short period of time. That it's is true. Very exciting. Uh, you mentioned energy, and they're going to need a lot of it oh, because, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, they are up at the International Space Station, as you mentioned earlier in the webcast. Freedom Houston on the big loop. Stand by for hardline audio config. All right, so uh, the the folks on board station are continuing uh, to work with uh, the teams in Houston and here in Hawthorne in order to finish the, the um, final preparations, both Dragon and uh, on station for the opening of the hatch. Um, but we were talking about uh, all the work that they're going to have to do, and they're going to need they're they're going to need a lot of energy to get through the next two weeks because uh, they they are up on orbit now. And it's going to be very busy. Yeah. Uh, not only uh, do they have scheduled sleep periods and scheduled meal periods and all that science, they're also going to want to, you know, take an opportunity exactly. to sit in the cupola, actually, exactly. in, the, in the launch broadcast. Right. Uh, there were some very cool words from the AX2 pilot, John Schaffner, and <laughs> he said... Sit in the cupola as much as you possibly yes, can. <laughs> yes, and how could you not? With views like that, how could you not want to take in as much of that as you can, Yeah. right? And also, while they're up there, they're going to be wanting to take in as much as they can from these other crew members. Absolutely. Right? We have two dragons on board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a packed ISS, yes. and they're going to want to get as much as they can and take that back home and talk to their nations about yeah, that. Yeah, for sure. So, talking about that crew, while we're waiting for Dragon and the AX-3 crew to actually go through the hatch and meet the rest of the ISS crew, let's go ahead and meet this AX-3 crew. So the commander of our flight today, Michael Lopez Alegria, or MLA, is no stranger to Axiom missions, Dragon, or the space station. In fact, AX-3 marks his sixth mission to space, having completed three space shuttle flights and a Soyuz mission as a NASA astronaut prior to commanding AX-1 with Axiom Space. And today, when not in low Earth orbit, or 
docked to the, <laughs> to the ISS, MLA serves as Axiom Space's chief astronaut. Our pilot on today's flight, Colonel Walter Villade from the Italian Air Force, uh, has taken his inaugural trip to low Earth orbit. Villade currently serves in the Italian Air Force and as the head of the Italian Air Force's representative office in the United States. He has completed cosmonaut training as a space engineer, participated in multiple analog training missions, and flown a variety of aircraft and missions as an active flight engineer in the Italian Air Force. Our third crew member for today's mission is Mission Specialist Alper Izarache. Alper is the first Turkish astronaut to go to space. With 15 years of experience across a myriad of aircraft for the Turkish Air Force, Izarache got his start in the Air Force Academy in Istanbul, Turkey, and earned a master's degree from the U.S. Air Force Institute of Technology. He then flew as a commercial airline captain for a number of years before returning to duty in the Turkish Air Force. And finally, uh, our mission specialist, Marcus Want, a lieutenant colonel in the Swedish Air Force. In November of 2022, Marcus was selected by the European Space Agency as an astronaut reserve. However, with the AX-3 mission, he now becomes the first project astronaut in ESA's history. And this is, this is a new designation within their ranks. So as you can tell, this is an incredible crew. They have years of experience and they are well prepared. They have trained quite a bit in order to uh, execute the AX-3 mission, not only on Dragon systems and space station systems, but also um, you know just all the procedures that they have to work through and all the science that yeah. they're going to have to do. Yeah, no, I, I think the word you hit on there, Kate, for me definitely is prepared. This crew, both individually and as a team, are so prepared for this mission. They have gone through years, collective years together, <laughs> um, uh, individually, but then as a team to train for this. And this is the first all European crew. This is a huge first for space flight. Um, they're representing five nations across the four of them. And missions like this really are critical for that future sustained low earth orbit commercialization of space flight that we talk about. Um, and this is one of those steps on that path. Yeah. yeah. So we have a great view here of the Dragon capsule, and you might have noticed that our views go in and out due to ground station coverage. We don't have views the entire time, so we, we, we show them when we have them, uh, and this view here is just breathtaking. Uh, it is a live view from the International Station of Dragon Freedom, uh, which has now successfully docked with the International Space Station. Uh, we had confirmation of docking complete at 2.56 a.m. Pacific time. And here you can see an animation of the uh, pressurized section, which is the top half, as well as the unpressurized section, which is the bottom half or the trunk. Um, some dimensions there, you can kind of get a feel for how big it is. Uh, the solar arrays there, uh, the, which is the black side of the trunk, those help to collect energy from the sun, which gets transverted, excuse me, which gets converted <laughs> uh, into a power source for the Dragon capsule while it is on orbit, uh, both while it is at the station as well as when it is approaching and um, as well as after it has undocked. So yeah, beautiful view. If you have, were watching our coverage earlier, there was a really cool moment, which we might actually get the reverse of it here coming up soon, but there was a very cool moment where... Um, the uh, I believe it was when when when when Gary was walking us through some some activity and uh, we were not able to see the capsule at or excuse me we weren't able to see uh, Dragon at all and then all of a sudden there was just a little bit of light yeah. and, it, and it did a great job of illustrating just how quickly the space station is orbiting the Earth it's going six, seventeen thousand five hundred miles per hour uh, and you complete an orbit every ninety minutes and it's hard to fathom yeah. what that what that feels like but the moment where it went this Dragon capsule uh, went from being completely dark to just a sliver of light to fully lit yeah. like it is here. Uh, it was it was a very cool moment. It, like you blink and you miss it. Yeah. But you're right. It was 
pitch black, and then the sun started rising on it, right? It had that image of it, and then suddenly it was there. Yeah, it was, it was gorgeous. very cool. Now, we mentioned that the crew has spent, um, uh, I, I guess at this point, it's almost like 37 and a half hours, uh, but in that time, they have completed uh, 25 orbits, so they they did have some downtime, uh, fortunately, whenever they were on orbit during this, this journey, and I'm sure that they were taking lots of pictures, yeah. and I've said it before if I were if I were in the spacecraft I would probably just have my face plastered to the window. Uh, somebody would have to fight me for, <laughs> for, <that seat. laughs> for access. Yeah. And yeah, so they, they've completed 90 orbits and I'm sure during that time they've they've taken in as many views as, as they possibly can. Oh, exactly. And they're going to take in so many more, right? The next step that this crew is looking forward to is opening that hatch. Yeah. That is such a pivotal moment for any crew, right? To get into the space station and get into the ISS and go meet their their crew members that they're going to be spending their time with. Um, it's, it is what the International Space Station represents. It's what it's for. Um, and they had so much to do on this 37 and a half hours, multiple orbits trip up there. But the next step really is crossing that hatch, meeting their coworkers mm -hmm. for the next two weeks, meeting their friends, yep. their neighbors, and getting to experience all of that in a much bigger atmosphere now you know yeah. they, they spent that time in the in the vehicle it's about to get a lot bigger and they're going to get they're going to get to go into the cupola yep. and see that view that we talked about they're going to get to experience living and working and all of the nuanced difficulties that come with that <laughs> in low earth orbit and it's going to be a really beautiful moment and that's really the next step that we're working towards is getting to open that hatch and it as gary mentioned it takes time for that to happen there's a lot of Timelined events that work up to once the vehicle is on orbit. Now the vehicle, now the crew that's on the ISS has to do a lot of preparation work in order to open that hatch and get that Dragon crew across. Yeah, so absolutely. we're working towards that moment now. And it, most of the, yeah, all the physical work for those preparations are being done by the crew on board station right now. But there is a, also a lot of work being done by the crews here at SpaceX Mission Control here in Hawthorne, California, as well as uh, ISS mission control in Houston. So there's a lot of integrated operations happening here. Actually, great view here, as we have seen a couple of times of both of those control rooms, uh, SpaceX mission control on the left, um, Houston mission control there on the right. And uh, a lot of integrated activities. If you've been if you've been following along, you've heard either SpaceX Core, which is the crew operations and resource engineer, or NASA's CAPCOM, uh, which it Freedom Houston on the big loop. Hardline audio config is complete. How do you hear? Yeah, Kate, uh, almost perfectly you mentioned Capcom there, right? <laughs> um, but one of the things that we're really working towards... Houston with Freedom, we hear you loud and clear. Um, we have you loud and clear as well. So that right there, just literally working through the procedures. Freedom Houston, can you try again on the big loop? Right now, trying to establish the communication on the big loop, uh, which is uh, everyone all together. The big loop is exactly as it sounds. It's um, it's Houston, it's the International Space Station, it's SpaceX, uh, it's Houston Dragon. Freedom on the big loop, Comp check. Loud and clear. Happy to say. All right, well, as we know, comm checks are an essential tool, an essential part of this effort, this joint effort that we have. And what the, the point that we're working towards at this moment is opening that hatch, and that will ultimately culminate in a um, uh, crew uh, crew meeting ceremony, a crew welcome ceremony, um, where, the, where the AX3 crew gets to meet their ISS crew. And so with that, we will toss it back over to Gary with Mission Control in Houston. 
Thank you, John. Thank you, Kate. Yes, we are monitoring the uh, operations here in Mission Control Houston. Uh, main thing we're looking forward to is that vestibule pressurization, but you just heard that hardline comm checks. That was that umbilical that was made in between the Dragon and the International Space Station, uh, providing power, no longer having to rely on the batteries and the solar arrays you see on the back end of Dragon from this view as the sun sets uh, and the International Space Station and Dragon orbit over northern China into an orbital uh, darkness. But that uh, hardline communication uh, looking good. The vestibule pressurization um, is also looking good. Uh, Laurel O'Hara working through the steps to go ahead and equalize that pressure uh, between the vestibule. Now there's a couple of steps. Um, first, of course, is equalizing that pressure and making sure uh, that the pressure between the Dragon hatch and Station hatch equalizes with that inside both of those vehicles. We're looking for about what we find at uh, sea level, 14.7 PSI. Now just as we did when we were pressurizing the vestibule before, we're going to uh, wait a little bit when we bring it up to pressure just to uh, do what's called a thermal relaxation. Um, when the pressure is brought up, there are these natural swings that occur due to the uh, temperature uh, inside of the vestibule, which has been exposed to vacuum up until the point of contact and capture from the dragon. So we'll just allow a couple of minutes for that to relax and just be absolutely sure that we have a good pressurization and that uh, we have no leaks indeed. We did, again, perform that leak check and everything looked good, which is why we are proceeding with these steps. But another caution before that A-pass hatch is open. Opened. Now, once that hatch is opened, Laurel O'Hara's uh, job is not done. It's not just opening up the hatch and then uh, opening up the Dragon hatch. The APAS hatch itself is outfitted with uh, what's called a docking target cross. Uh, now, this was the cross that you may have seen when uh, Dragon was approaching the International Space Station. It's just really this target uh, that allows for the guidance and navigation control equipment inside Dragon to lock on. Uh, uh, very precisely to the APAS hatch and go in for uh, a uh, docking. Now that is a removable um, that is a removable part of the APAS hatch uh, and part of the outfitting procedures. So Laurel O'Hara will go ahead and take that cross off and then cover the APAS hatch just as a protective measure. Make sure no one's bumping their heads on the way in, um, as it can be a tight squeeze to go in between the Dragon and APAS hatches and through the uh, pressurized mating adapter. She'll outfit the hatch, taking off the cross, uh, putting on a cover, and then she'll also route some duct. Uh, through the pressurized mating adapter that will blow some fresh uh, cabin air from inside the International Space Station to that vestibule. Uh, interesting thing that happens in uh, microgravity is uh, when air is not actively circulating in the pressurized mating adapter, which often that uh, node to forward hatch is closed, sometimes there can be these interesting pockets of uh, carbon dioxide. So this will flow some fresh air, make sure the temperature and make sure that air is well mixed and the temperature is good. Um, and allow a very comfortable, safe, and uh, cushy float into the International Space Station for that Axiom Mission 3 crew. So again, Laurel O'Hara, just to recap, is continuing with the pressurization of that uh, APAS hatch, making sure that everything is good uh, for the Axiom Mission 3 crew. Uh, of course, it is not just um, Mission Control Houston and uh, Mission Control Hawthorne, California. Right down the road from here in Mission Control Houston is MCCA, Mission Control Axiom, who are going to be monitoring, who have been monitoring the crew throughout this journey and will continue to work in tandem with the International Space Station flight control teams here in Houston through many of the activities they have scheduled for their long stay aboard. Long meaning just about two weeks. Uh, we can expect them to uh, do some of the things that John was talking about, some science activities, many outreach activities, lots planned for the private astronauts uh, who are going to be spending their day, uh, their days aboard the station and maximize every day and the opportunities they have while on board the orbiting complex.
But again, we're standing by. We're following along on the uh, repressurization, the pressurization procedures between the uh, International Space Station and Dragon. The uh, Axiom Mission 3 astronauts docked aboard Dragon Freedom to the International Space Station at 4.42 a.m. Central Time, just a little more than an hour ago at this point. After that soft capture, they went through the sequence of um, the, the docking sequence, which includes a hard dock and the 12 latches that secure Dragon to the International Space Station, mating umbilicals, stowing the soft capture ring, and ensuring that Dragon is secured to the International Space Station. Now the teams are working in tandem to bring that pressurization, the space in between those two hatches, those two vehicles, up to equalize so they can start opening up the hatches and uh, welcome the crew. Now it's been a long day for the crew, so uh, we can expect, based on the timeline that we're seeing, uh, hatches to open in perhaps about uh, 40 minutes. Um, and uh, an event to, a welcome event to happen uh, shortly after that. We'll follow the operations uh, just to see you exactly when those times occur. Two, eight, five, five, just open, no condensation. Houston copies. That was confirmation from Laurel O'Hara and uh, Jasmine Mogbelli. The two of them were tasked with uh, monitoring Dragon's approach and docking to the International Space Station. Laurel O'Hara has been mostly at work, but of course, uh, Jasmine Mogbelli not far behind. Two of them working to, uh, like I said, pressurize that vestibule, which we just heard uh, has been pressurized and equalized. And that APAS hatch, this is the hatch on the International Space Station side, that is now open. So with that APAS hatch open, the uh, ISS crew can go through the steps to outfit the hatch uh, before they open up the Dragon hatch. Now we've been checking in with the Dragon crew, the Axiom Mission 3 crew, periodically. They've been working through the steps to doff their suits and prepare uh, for eventual ingress uh, while the International Space Station crew goes through these procedures. But just to review once again, uh, once the APAS hatch is open, there's a bit more steps to go. Uh, there's uh, a couple of steps to outfit the APAS hatch itself, including taking off the uh, docking target cross, uh, which was used to as part of the rendezvous uh, approach and docking procedures that allowed targeting from the Dragon spacecraft to accurately dock to the International Space Station. It sticks out a bit, so that'll be removed just as a safety uh, measure, as well as covering the APAS hatch. The APAS hatch is uh, made of uh, metal, so of course, the uh, covering the hatch will be another safety measure just to ensure um, when the uh, Axiom Mission 3 crew uh, ingresses, in case they do uh, bump their head, it won't be as, uh, as uh, it won't be uh, as much of an issue. So those safety measures and just making sure that the pressurized mating adapter itself is nice and clear. Now, in addition to outfitting the hatch, they will also ensure that air is circulating properly in this vestibule, which is, uh, has been closed primarily. And uh, now, especially the vestibule has been exposed to vacuum up until the point of docking. So uh, Laurel O'Hara and Jasmine Gobelli will route some ducts, some air ducts down into the pressurized mating adapter and blow some fresh cabin air from inside the International Space Station to circulate, get some of those pockets and circulate fresh air, equalize the temperature, uh, and make sure uh, that they are ready to welcome that crew.
Dragon B6 on the big loop, looking for a status on 4.012 and also 4.400. SpaceX left start with uh, 4400. We're in section 5, flushing the urine hose. We'll have a consumables report here in just a minute. Copy that in section 5 and consumables report coming shortly. That's a good copy. You'll notice as part of these joint operations, crew operations, resource engineer checking in with Haley the Dragon crew. 4.012 in section 3. Uh, comfort garments for seats 1, 3, and 4 will be trashed. Mine were trashed after launch. And all four suits are disinfected and being dried in various stages. Copy, Dragon. So comfort garments for one, three, and four will be trashed, and all suits are drying. Copy. SpaceX Freedom, would you like that inventory report on the big loop or on Dragon to Ground? And Dragon, you can go ahead and bring that to Dragon to Ground. Okay. It's Dragon on Dragon to Ground. And Dragon, I've got you loud and clear. Sorry for back, so we're in uh, port of 400 section three, and uh, when it comes to bottles consumed, water bottles, we have consumed uh, a total of um, 19 bottles, uh, so all bottles in bag 201, all bottles in 202, all bottles in 204, and we have consumed four bottles from 203. All right, copy Dragon, 19 bottles, all in 201, 202, 204, and four consumed from 203. Meals consumed are all meals from uh, 301, all from 302, all from 304, and two from 303. Copy Dragon, all meals in 301, 302, 304, and two from 303. Thank you. Good reback. So a quick recap, we're continuing to work through the procedures of preparing the uh, Axiom Mission 3 astronauts ingress into the International Space Station and welcome by the Expedition 70 crew. Activities happening on both ends of the hatches. We just heard a status report from the uh, crew inside Dragon Freedom uh, talking about their consumables and getting the uh, Dragon capsule itself ready for its uh, two-week stay aboard the International Space Station. Sex Freedom back on from the big left loop to right. now in section 6 of 4.400 ready to equalize. And Dragon, copy, you are in section six of 4.400.
The ISS crew has opened the APAS hatch and are working through docking target uninstall, so we'll get back to you shortly on when we're proceeding to hatch open. And Dragon SpaceX on the big loop, looking to see if we are good to come back on board with video. Give us uh, a few minutes, I'll call you back. Copy that. Houston Dragon Station on Space Room 2. Station is ready for Dragon Hatch equalization. Houston copies. Stand by. And Freedom is ready as well. Now getting views from the inside of the International Space Station. You can see some of the work that's been done before the uh, crew was able to set up some of the cameras. Laura O'Hara there on the right. She's been the one working through the hatch opening procedures and she was working on the docking procedures as well. Commander of the International Space Station in the background there, Andreas Mogensen. In the foreground, Jasmine Mogbelli, NASA astronaut, has been working in tandem with Laura O'Hara to uh, monitor Dragon's arrival and the Axiom Mission 3 crew, as well as through the hatch opening steps.
So again, um, Laura O'Hara and Jasmine Mogbelli have methodically worked to opening up the hatches you see in the background there. So right in the back, uh, that is the pressurized mating adapter. You can see the on the forward end, right behind Andreas Mogensen, is the node to forward hatch that is open and stowed at the top portion of your screen. And then uh, deep in the uh, pre uh, pressurized mating adapter is the A-pass hatch, which has been outfitted for uh, the Axiom Mission 3 crew's arrival. Docking target has been removed. Covers have been added. Uh, and ducks have uh, been brought in to circulate air, and you can see at this point have uh, have already been pulled out. So the area in, in, within the pressurized mating adapter and vestibule has been um, equalized with the pressure of the International Space Station. The next step really is opening up the uh, Dragon Hatch. So the teams are just assessing just to make sure that that is okay to do, but you can see crews gathering right now. They got their cameras ready, um, smiles, and ready to welcome the Axiom Mission 3 uh, astronauts to the International Space Station. Coming into frame is uh, Satoshi Furukawa. Heading left from this view into the Japanese experiment module. Furukawa with a uh, high-definition microphone in tow. We'll start to equip it um, and will be used as part of the welcome ceremony. We can expect the uh, full Expedition 70 crew to be there to greet the uh, Axiom Mission 3 astronauts. See hugs and handshakes as they ingress. By the time we have all four um, Axiom crew members on board the station, the station population will be up to 11. Station and Freedom, Houston on the Big Loop. Stand by for equalization, expected to take three minutes. Freedom copies. Michael Lopez Alegria, the commander uh, of Dragon Freedom for the Axiom Mission 3. Uh, mission confirming uh, that he'll start working through the steps to equalize the pressure and to open up the hatch of uh, Dragon Freedom. We should be expecting ingress momentarily. In the meantime, we have more members of Expedition 70 gathering to welcome the crew. On the right there, you see Konstantin Borisov, who flew up with the uh, Crew 7 uh, cadre to the International Space Station.
Again, two uh, control rooms working in tandem through these operations. The Expedition 70 crew standing by, awaiting for equalization to go ahead and open up the hatch of Dragon. Should be expecting hatch open momentarily to welcome the Axiom Mission 3 astronauts to the International Space Station. Team's just uh, ensuring the equalization is good before going ahead to open up the hatch, but we should be expecting that momentarily. International Space Station Commander Andreas Mogensen heading towards the hatch. On the right, Oleg Kononenko, another Roscosmos cosmonaut, and Nikolai Chub. Expedition 70 now ready. Dragon rounded 26 out. on the big loop. You have a go for hatch opening per your decal followed by the remaining actions in procedure 4.400, section 6, and confirming uh, if we are good to come back on board with cameras. SpaceX, freedom, I'll be stand by one. Again, the seven members of Expedition 70 gathered in Node 2. In the background there is the forward end of the International Space Station. At the end of the pressurized mating adapter is Dragon Freedom and the Axiom Mission 3 crew members. Sex Freedom, you may come on board and we're opening the hatch. Copy that, Freedom. Section Houston on the big loop, the Dragon Ford hatch is open. SpaceX copies. 6.13 a.m. Central Time, Dragon Hatch is open.
Jasmine Moog belly in the background there with the still camera. Way down in the pressurized mating adapter is Andreas Mogensen, International Space Station Commander. Working with the uh, Dragon crew to open up the Dragon hatch, and we should be seeing some of the private astronaut mission crew members. Freedom on the big loop, we are complete with 4 400 entering ISS. Copy that, Freedom. Welcome aboard. Coming together first through the hatches, Marcus Wandt and Alper Gizarauchi of Sweden and Turkey, respectively, being greeted by the crew of Expedition 70. The two are followed by Walter Villaday, pilot of the Dragon Freedom, last coming into the International Space Station, Commander Michael Lopez Alegria. Eleven crew members representing seven nations now on board the International Space Station. Again, 11 crew members on board the International Space Station now, representing Expedition 70 and the Axiom Mission 3 crew. We're now in a short handover period. We should be regaining the video and audio from the International Space Station momentarily to celebrate with the crew the welcome of Axiom Mission 3 to the International Space Station. With the crew uh, now on board the International Space Station, all hatches open between the uh, Dragon spacecraft and the International Space Station. Once we regain video from the, from the International Space Station, we should be uh, preparing for setting up a welcome ceremony. All 11 crew members will gather for some remarks uh, to commemorate this, mom this uh, moment. Back on board the International Space Station. Again, Expedition 70 gathered with the Axiom Mission 3 crew. All chatting ahead and uh, having some initial remarks uh, amongst each other before we begin that formal welcome ceremony.
Houston station on two. With you on two. Uh, we'll go on time for the event, so at uh, 35. We copy. So the crew of Expedition 70 and, uh, again, Axiom Mission 3 astronauts on board the International Space Station confirming uh, they have a set block of time for starting this welcome ceremony, and they will take it right now, 6.20 a.m. We should be starting that welcome ceremony in 15 minutes. Station Houston on two, we're standing by for scene and voice. Copy, I just need to change the batteries. Just a second. We copy. Multinational crew currently gathered in Node 2 ahead of the welcome ceremony. We're expecting that to start in at uh, 6.35 a.m. Central Time. Jasmine Mobelli, a NASA astronaut in the foreground, speaking with Oleg Kononenko, Roscosmos cosmonaut. To his right is Roscosmos cosmonaut Konstantin Borisov, speaking with uh, Walter Villaday of Italy. Uh, uh, and the pilot of Dragon Freedom for uh, Axiom Mission 3. Expedition 70 member Nikolai Chub coming into frame behind Mog Belly. Freedom Crew Houston on the big loop. Uh, just a friendly reminder, we need for you to complete step six and two decimal one zero two prior to the event. Yeah, Houston, this is Freedom on the big loop. We are complete with 6.1, your go for IMV fan activation. Copy, we'll get it at work. We are ready for the voice check. Thanks, Andy. We can use another 10 count, please.
Good, scene and voice check. As is typical with uh, in-flight events aboard the International Space Station conducting a scene and voice check, and we're seeing more members of Expedition 70 gather ahead of the uh, welcome ceremony. Of course, we still have uh, Commander of Axiom Mission 3, Michael Lopez Alegria, and the mission specialists that were aboard Dragon Freedom, Alper, Ge Alper Gezerauchi, and Marcus Want. In frame here, we have pilot uh, Walter Villade of Italy. To his right, to our right, his left, commander of uh, Expedition 70 aboard the International Space Station, Andreas Mogensen of Denmark. Going right from there is Konstantin Borisov and Oleg Koninenko of Roscosmos. Continuing around the circle, Laurel O'Hara. And Jasmine Mogbelli of NASA. And on the left, Nikolai Freedom Chu. Freedom crew, Houston on the big loop. You have a go for 2.102, steps 6.2 and 6.3. To clarify, Freedom, you have a go to complete the rest of step six. Again, we're tracking towards uh, the welcome ceremony of all 11 crew members on board the International Space Station starting at 6.35 a.m. Central Time. This is really the middle of the day for the Expedition 70 crew members and Axiom Mission 3 crew members. Right after the welcome ceremony, uh, their day is not quite done. All crew members will, part will participate in an, in an initial International Space Station safety briefing just to ensure they're up to date with the latest uh, information and the freshest information as they proceed about the rest of their day. Some of the crew members will then enjoy a lunch while the remaining crew members are briefed by the International Space Station uh, Expedition 70 Commander Andreas Mogensen, uh, who will brief the private astronauts who have just been welcomed on board the International Space Station Axiom Mission 3. Astronauts will get a briefing from the uh, commander. Afterwards, the uh, Axiom Mission 3 astronauts will proceed with cargo unloading and some initial experiment and equipment setup uh, before the end of their day. Tomorrow, Sunday, is a relatively light day for the Expedition 70 and private astronaut crew members. 
continuing with some cargo transfer ops, but setting up some initial experiments uh, and enjoying a lighter day before they really hit the ground running for their first week aboard the International Space Station. Axiom Mission 3 is expected to be a 14-day mission. Right now we're targeting approximately February 3rd, pending weather, uh, for uh, the undock opportunity for uh, the Axiom Mission 3 astronauts to leave the International Space Station and splash down off the coast of Florida. But of course, starting Monday, we'll begin um, a myriad of scientific and education activities uh, for them to complete. All this work has been timelined in months in advance uh, to coordinate the schedules of 11 crew members on board the International Space Station to ensure there is a seamless transition of, of using different scientific experiments and facilities uh, and that 11 crew members can get an incredible amount of science and discovery done in a short amount of time. SpaceX in Houston from Freedom on the Big Loop. We're complete through step eight of 2.102. Houston copies. And SpaceX copies. Axiom Mission 3 crew member and mission specialist aboard Dragon, Marcus Want, coming into frame. We'll start seeing all 11 crew members come into frame as they close out some of their activities. We're expecting to begin the welcome ceremony on time in just about three minutes. Station Houston on the big loop. We are two minutes out from the event.
station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? We are ready for the event. Please begin the welcome ceremony. Andy Houston on two, can you check the mic, please? <laughs> on, beha on behalf of the uh, Expedition 70 crew, I'd like to welcome uh, Axiom 3 on board the International Space Station. This is uh, an incredibly exciting time for human spaceflight with the third private mission which is allowing many more countries to participate in the scientific research and technology development that we do on board this orbiting laboratory. Uh, we have doubled the number of nationalities on board the space station going from four to eight, which I think is a great testament to the international collaboration which underpins this uh, marvelous space station. I'm also very proud as a European to welcome four other Europeans. I think this is the first time in the history of the space station that we have five Europeans on board uh, at the same time. And certainly uh, it's the first time that we have two Scandinavians uh, on board. So I'm very happy to welcome my, f my fellow Scandinavian, Marcus. Um, but we look forward to the next two weeks uh, to an intense period of work on board the space station. So a big warm welcome to Axiom 3 uh, from us on board the space station. Thanks, Andy. I think you said it very well. This is really a, um, a symbol of how Axiom in conjunction with NASA and all the partners is working to expand human access to low Earth orbit. And we've got, uh, as Andy said, so many nationalities represented on board, and this is really symbolic of what we're trying to do to open it up, not only to other nations, also to individuals, to researchers, to continue the great work that's been going on on board the ISS for the last two decades plus. The ride uphill was uh, pretty exciting. Uh, never gets old. Um, I think we probably spent a few more hours in Dragon than we felt like we needed to, but uh, it was all good. Great vehicle. Thanks to you at SpaceX for putting that thing together for us and for such smooth operation. Let me pass the microphone down to my crewmates just for a couple words, and then I'd like to get it back at the very end if that's okay. Walter? Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I want to, first of all, uh, thank uh, the expedition crew for this uh, warm uh, welcoming. It's uh, amazing to uh, be up here and to see how much really all the countries and this uh, amazing uh, international collaboration has made in space, uh, creating this outpost. And I'm very grateful uh, for Italy and uh, just a few words in Italian. So thank you. Grazie e un uh, grazie a tutta l'Italia. Vorrei ringraziare non solo l'aeronautica militare, ma anche tutte le istituzioni che hanno portato qui questa missione in questo straordinario contesto di collaborazione internazionale in cui abbiamo portato scienza e per due settimane saremo qui a collaborare e lavorare con questo equipaggio internazionale straordinario grazie mille e now I hand over to my colleagues and friend uh, Alper from Turkey thanks so much uh, I would like to thank first for your kind hospitality to Expedition 7 crew over here uh, they were very waiting for us at the door actually so that was a very nice <laughs> kind welcoming for us um, I would like to thank for everybody for their great effort uh, for us to be able to make it over here in the last eight months training period as well as all the counterparts uh, for their contribution for our safe travel uh, to make it over to ISS we are happy as Turkey uh, to step for the first time in our history and um, looking forward to contribute into the science and research uh, efforts over here. And I would like to say a couple words uh, to my country. Um, Türkiye Cumhuriyeti'ni kurarak bizlere emanet eden Gazi Mustafa Kemal Atatürk uh, ve silah arkadaşlarına bu vatan için canını veren tüm şehitlerimize uh, buraya adım atmamızı sağlayan 
güçlü iradesiyle devletimize ve bu imkanları bize sağlayan milletimize şükranlarımı sunuyorum. İstikbal göklerdedir. Now I would like to pass over the microphone to my dear friend Marcus Wand from uh, Sweden representing here ISA. Thank you Alper. I also want to say first a big uh, thank you to Expedition 70 for gre greeting us and knocking on our door uh, in the middle of uh, everything. <laughs> it was pretty amazing been flying around and orbiting Earth for 36 hours or so and then someone knocks on the door. That's pretty strange. <laughs> and uh, uh, also uh, I want to say that having that this many, many nationalities uh, on a mission like this and it just tells me that uh, collaboration can take you very far. Entering uh, the hatch here and meeting other people in space from so many different cultures and places around the world just uh, give me a strong sense of future, uh, which is which is awesome. I uh, also want to say a few words in uh, in Swedish to uh, Sweden. So, uh, hey, allihopa där hemma. Det här är förstås en fantastisk känsla. Uppskjutningen var en uh, resa. Jag har aldrig varit med något liknande förut. Och... Uh, Sen att få se jorden från ovan och sväva runt och känna att Sverige på ett så kraftfullt och beslutsamt sätt valde att ställa sig långt fram i utvecklingen igen, vilket vi ofta gör och fortsätter vara ett innovationsland och visa andra att gott samarbete fungerar. För vi har också här pionerat det nya sättet för Europa att ta sig upp och öka frekvensen i rymdutforskningen på ett sätt som, som vi inte har sett förut. Så otroligt stolt att få representera Sverige och Europa här uppe. All right, thank you. Mike. So now I'd like to uh, continue a bit of a tradition that we started, and that is to award the Universal Astronaut Symbol Pin, if I don't lose it, to each of these um, steely-eyed aviators. Uh, I think it's telling that these will be the seventh, eighth, and ninth people that uh, Axiom has provided pins. In fact, since we started flying in 2022, no agency has pinned more new astronauts, and again, this is symbolic of us trying to open up the access to low Earth orbit to more and more people. So first of all, Colonel Walter Villade, it is my pleasure to, no, no, I'm going to put it on you. Oh, right. Hey. <laughs> You'll be number 609. Wow. That's a privilege, Mike. Thank you so much. Let me see if I can stabilize myself without messing. Can, uh, if you can slide down yeah. and have uh, these guys slide here. Right. Thank you. This is a real pleasure to award this pen to the first Turkish astronaut in history. I don't think I need to say anything more. Alper. Can you hold the microphone? Yep. And finally, Marcus. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Mike. I failed to mention Alper obviously is uh, number 610 and Marcus is 611. And finally, I want to thank all of you guys again for welcoming us aboard. I know that it's tough uh, to have guests in your house, and we promise not to spill any red wine on your white carpet. <laughs> thank you, Andy. Once again, uh, welcome, and we look forward to working with you for the next two weeks. It's going to be an incredible mission, and uh, we're excited to have guests. Thank you to all participants, and welcome aboard Axiom 3. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.
All right, 11 astronauts on board the International Space Station working together for science and discovery. It's going to be a, a very busy and jam-packed couple of weeks with uh, a full space station, uh, but certainly nothing that can't be handled. This will be the third time we have a private astronaut crew on board the International Space Station. The third time we have 11 astronauts as part of this mix as complements of private and government astronauts. And of course, the private astronauts representing their own governments expanding nations to seven nations right now on board station, conducting science uh, for uh, the benefit, really, of the world. For that, uh, really, that will conclude our coverage here uh, in Mission Control Houston before, of course, the expedition uh, uh, crew and the Axiom Mission 3 astronauts. Really, the journey has just begun. Uh, so that'll wrap it up here in Houston. I'll toss it over to Kate for some closing words from Hawthorne. Thanks so much, Gary. It really was so wonderful to see them all together. Some really nice words there uh, from our commander, MLA. But on that note, we're going to wrap up our live joint coverage of AX-3's arrival to the International Space Station. It's been an honor to support the Axiom-3 mission thus far. We wish Marcus, Alper, Walter, and MLA a successful time on station, and we look forward to joining you when it's time to return home. Yeah, Kate, from launch to docking, it has been an absolute pleasure sharing this desk with you again, so thank you. Over the course of the crew's time on station, we will be producing mission updates from Axiom's Space Station Development Facility with Commander Lopez Alegria sharing highlights and special moments with Walter, Alper, and Marcus. So please be sure to visit axiomspace.com and follow the Axiom social media channels for real-time updates. And with that, on behalf of SpaceX, Axiom Space, and NASA, thank you all for tuning in to watch from wherever you're watching from. With that, good morning, good evening, or good night. <laughs> Thank you.